letter was um, how can you be? Yeah. aspects of this which includes is it consistent with a comprehensive plan or not is there sufficient public good the way I interpret this is that there's fairly broad discretion um, on what the town council decides based on this and Tom is that uh, an accurate representation in your it is there's a slight nuance this this uh, brief this legal overview is really framed um, from the perspective of uh, you know, a positive finding that of consistency and, and sufficient public benefit, if you will. So there is clearly broad discretion in that regard to the council. I think the council has equally broad discretion uh, in finding otherwise, uh, for different reasons perhaps. Uh, but the, the statute and the courts have been fairly clear on this point that the council has broad discretion when it comes to making these findings. And what I think was important about that, and, and I should preface this by apologizing for the lateness, but I thought it frankly would be helpful and maybe some comfort because I'd heard a number of concerns from counselors in discussion and talking to you individually uh, that you couldn't get past the fundamental question of consistency with the comp plan. And I had hoped that this would be some comfort that you needn't be paralyzed by that. Uh, you could you could move past that point. I, I think there is a way for the this, this body to make uh, a positive finding in that regard. Uh, and, and be comfortable in making that decision. That was the intent of this. Um, on the flip side, though, uh, you have equally broad discretion to say no. And 
I think uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I suspect our lawyer would advise that we would uh, articulate some findings in support of that decision of, of rejecting an application. Um, but I'm not sure if we actually have to. Um, so there's broad discretion abounds here. So, so with that, um, before we move into the conversation, does anybody have any questions about the document or anything for Councilor <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not about the document. It's just something that I know has come up, and I'd like to just lay it out on the table, and that is just going very way back to the very beginning about the question regarding are we, in fact, amending an existing contract zone, or should this be a totally new contract zone because is this a contiguous lot or an adjacent lot, and what's the law around that? Yeah, I was privy to those discussions. I don't think the contiguous aspect is a, a defining characteristic, though I think it is helpful in, in considering this as an amendment. I think there are other elements, given common ownership, common similar use. There's other elements that give rise to this being considered as, as an amendment. I'm, I'm not sure if there's a right or a wrong way. Our, we did review this matter at the outset with a town attorney who did not disagree with the approach of an amendment. Uh, it's worth noting the only difference would be if it would be entertained as a new contract zone uh, proposal, uh, the process essentially starts off slightly differently. Mm -hmm. But uh, we are uh, very quickly, we're, we would be right back at the same point we are now. The matter is pending before the planning board and doesn't come back to you until it has preliminary approval. Uh, but it really it does start differently. It's a mm -hmm. procedural difference. Yeah. So, one thing I'd I'd like to just build on uh, what Gene Marie said. So, you know, in the, in the interest of us trying to develop a balanced view, uh, you know, the, the timing of the document is unfortunate. You know, just seeing it a few minutes before uh, we walk into a meeting, you know, that that is just doesn't is not fair to anybody. Um, and when I read this, I, this reads to me as if it's a position paper. And I read through this. I don't see any reference in here at all to uh, the comment that you made about the, the broad discretion of the council and the, the opportunity for the council to decide for any reason or no reason at all. So when I'm viewing this and I'm kind of looking at this in terms of a process and us trying to get our arms around the whole thing without it dragging on too long, this, this doesn't really fit with what I've read and seen so far, number one. Number two, it, I have a problem with, uh, um, you know, uh, with how this is really going to help us, you know, arrive at a better decision. And, it, and it's completely inconsistent with what, what I understood to be the original purpose of this workshop, which was to try to understand the gap. So I, I have those, you know, the, and I'm trying not to overreact to the timing issue, but this, you know, uh, an hour, and I'm a fast reader, but it just, uh, just as I'm reading it now for a second time, I, it, it reads like a position paper to me, and not objective, uh, and not particularly helpful. So I just, you know, that's, that's my In my defense, I'd like to provide some view. context. This, mm. this legal opinion, or not even opinion, but uh, overview of the legal standards uh, that apply was an outgrowth of a conversation I had mm. with Chairman Hayes mm. midday yesterday. Um, I asked a number of questions to the town attorney, and it became clear to me pretty quickly that um, it might be helpful, and perhaps I'm wrong, for it to be clearly stated what the legal standards are. And that's what this document intends to do. So, and I turned it around as soon as I received it this afternoon. So my choice was either withhold it or to provide it. So you know, I understand the intent, but the effect is really quite different uh, in terms of my, my reading it. And I remember we started, uh, we had an entire workshop devoted to the top of contract zones that was run by Jay Chase that was quite detailed and very educational. Um, you know, I have to admit I haven't referred back to that. But that was, um, was broad, general, and provided some excellent context. I'm just having a very hard time tying this, you know, and, and how the workshop is beginning with where we began. So I just, you know... Um, I, I and I appreciate the intent. I appreciate the desire to be responsive and to get another opinion in there. But I, uh, it just, uh, just didn't, didn't grab me the right way. So. so, does anybody have what we're trying to do? Is 
we've, talk, we've seen the document, we've talked about it. Does anybody have any specific questions about it? If not, are we comfortable with moving ahead with the conversation, which was really trying to identify, are there any common, can we build any consensus about this project and the types of things that are a concern of ours or not, and, and, give, and give further guidance to a new proposal or a different proposal coming back? So I, I'll kind of defer to you. One, two, three, four. <laughs> that was the way I saw the hands go up. Which way? Who's first? I thought it was Jean Rose okay, first, Jean then Marie. Sean, then Paul. Okay. I could be wrong. Sorry. Oh, right. you want me to start? I mean, sure. this has to do with just your question, Dawn. Um, I see this document as a reiteration of, of materials we've had before. That's how I read that. So it was just to me a quick and easy reiteration. I didn't see anything new in it. Just That was just my reading of it. Um, what would you like me to say, Mr. Hayes, at this point? Just, just whether you're comfortable moving ahead with the conversation. Yes. Okay. And I think Sean was too? Is that? Too? Yeah. So um, I don't have anything um, new to add to the, uh, to the letter, I think. Um, um, receiving something that quickly sometimes happens. It happens in business. It happens, especially when the request for it was made uh, yesterday. Um, I think it's reasonable to then turn it over to us today. And I would rather have all of the information turned over to us rather than having the managers um, hold that back. So I appreciate um, the discretion that he showed in that. Um, I do want to understand, Don, you, um, and I have to apologize because I missed the first workshop on the pipe of choice problem, or the pipe of choice um, request. Um, what is the gap that the purpose of this meeting was to fill in the gap? Personally, based on my experience with this particular project, having been on the council when it was first approved and where I am today, um, I don't know where that gap is, and I need to understand where the rest of you are. If I could get an overview of what that gap is and what we're trying to fill in, it would be extremely helpful because I haven't heard that from anybody yet. I could take a stab, and I think the, the purpose of tonight's conversation is in the workshop we did have. Mm -hmm. There were a number of us that expressed lots of concerns, and it looked like um, we really didn't get a clear consensus on what types of things would be important to get to a yes. The, the feeling really was, and we were asked specifically by the developer, by Piper Shores, could we be more clear about the areas that were of concern to us, areas that we would like to see them address in some manner to, to come back for a, a, a rework proposal. Can, can you give me a, um, a very um, executive level broad description of what those concerns were. Um, is it comprehensive plan? Is it, um, uh, you know, what were the specific things that you were looking to have answered in that? I, I think there was some conversation or some questions about is it, first of all, consistent with the comprehensive mm -hmm. plan? That was a concern that many shared, several shared. Um, there was a concern about is there sufficient public good and trying to understand what that public good was for this project. Um, there were some concerns about just the, the number of units and the timing of the units and whether it was 51 or the additional units that was talked about. There was conversations about there is a back parcel of land that butts up against Camp Ketcha and it's kind of looked like where the additional units might go, but there was some talk about could something be done with that. Um, there was certainly some talk about affordable housing and what the solution for that would be, you know, in lieu of versus maybe something on site. Um, what were some of the other concerns? Traffic, traffic, traffic and safety as it relates to, you know, people crossing the streets, concerns um, of that sort. Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen a, you know, a fair number of letters that have been coming in, um, you know, that are you know, highlighting the positive aspects of it. Uh, the other thing that I think we touched on on a couple of points is just the process that was followed or lack of a process that was followed in terms of the, the you know, approach of amendment versus application and, uh, you know, the discontinuity between uh, uh, approaching contract zones um, uh, in those respective ways. Um, there, there was also a fair amount of discussion around uh, The, you know the general area I mean it's clearly an RF zone there was no there was no uh, nothing other than an, than an RF zone and that entire area <coughs> before uh, the first uh, the current Piper Shores development was was built so I mean those those were just you know ones that also occurred to me that uh, factored in and there was uh, a pretty strong yeah. concern of 
both immediate and butter property owners were yeah. were at the workshop. That I'm very much aware. Yeah. Of. Yeah. In fact, in fact, uh, you know, all of the abutters who spoke, or all the abutters yeah. that were consulted, you know, indicated, you know, unanimous opposition, unanimous and vocal opposition. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, I think two other items that I took note of. Um, Blastings and or water quality water challenges water. Yep. Yep. that may yep. yep. result yep. and connectivity of sidewalks. There was some conversation yep. around yep. that. And, um, and, there was, and there was some conversation around the, the tax appeal that's underway also. Um, so I think, Katie, were you, were you free? I thought Paul was after. Oh, Paul? Okay, no, you Paul. take three. I'm fine. I'm taking it all in right now. So <laughs> I was, I was very pointing hopeful. to Sean when I was raising my hand. Uh, okay, all right. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go back to your first question. Uh, and as terms of, so I mean, I, no one at this table will be surprised by my response because people know I get a little crazy in the head when I get stuff last minute because it does, um, especially if I need to make a decision. I'm a little less nervous about this document just because um, it's not, we're not making a decision tonight. And as I, after I've read it, it as Jean Marie pointed out, it doesn't really point to anything new. I, I mean, the whole piece around a contract zone is we do have discretion, yes or no. Um, so I, I will, while I would agree that it does read a little bit more like, yeah, sure, you can do this, no problem, as in kind of taking a position, it doesn't change where I feel as a, as a counselor in terms of I know I can vote yes or no. <laughs> like that's okay. the whole beauty of a contract zone, right? Um, so I, I guess... You know, if this were a budget document and it was the night of the budget vote, I would be like, no way am I going to be comfortable with this conversation tonight. I can have a conversation. Um, you know, we're here. So, uh, and time is precious. Um, mm -hmm. And I appreciate, you know, Tom's need to turn it around quickly. But I, I just, I think we have to be really careful about that going forward on any issue. It's just not, you know, I was working. I don't know when this got sent out, but... Mm -hmm. I don't check my town email all day long, constantly. Um, and if there is an emergency, someone can text me, um, say, "Hey, check your email. There's an emergency." Then I, I will then I can immediately make that transition and do that. And I'm happy to do that. It's just that I have a lot of clients who say they have an emergency too. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so that's I'm okay with okay. going forward. Um, but I want us to be really mindful of timeliness with these things like this because it, it 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 immediately puts my hackles up. Like, uh oh, there's something wrong here. And there could be absolutely nothing wrong here, but I tend to go on guard, which takes me from an open mindset to, nope, I'm just going to say no. And I don't think that's the intent or the desire. Paul, well, anything else? I, mean, I think everything about, has been said about the document, so to speak. But I would, I'm in agreement with Jean Marie and Katie as far as my first go with this. I feel like it just reiterates that what we knew in the okay. first place. Um, moving to the gap, I, I mean, I, I don't feel as if we have new information than we did the night of the joint workshop. Uh, so to be completely honest with you, I'm particularly interested in some of the counselors. For instance, Sean wasn't there, and Katie, you weren't there for the, for the actual joint workshop. Um, so as far as tonight's concerned, I first wanted to hear from both of you because I think we spoke a lot during that first workshop. So. I would be interested to know what my fellow counselors' positions are. Because um, personally, I feel like I've said pretty much publicly the way I feel right now. So I'm, I'm looking for somebody to pull me across the gap more than offer up anything that would bring me somewhere. So, so everyone else do the heavy lifting. No, so that's not. That's, <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> that was well, we're done. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, Maybe it was enough. I'll keep going. <laughs> no, I, I think for tonight, if at some point it'd be good just to reiterate or summarize. Sure. Let me summarize my position. There you go. Let me summarize my position. Um, currently, that where I am with this is I see an RF zone that is um, that's being asked for a contract zone. I think that the density of the current contract zone is high. Um, I have. I don't disagree. Public benefit is what we we're all very aware of. Public benefit is very difficult to define. So, it, are they going to generate a lot more tax revenue than 15 single-family houses? They are. That's a public benefit, right? So I'm not going to pretend that 
let's say four hundred thousand dollars a year is not a public benefit. Uh, are they going to provide housing for people? They are, and I'm not. I'm, I don't necessarily care if they are providing housing for current residents. To be honest with you, they're they're providing homes for people, and that's mm -hmm. enough for me. And that's to me, that's a public benefit. Uh, I just ha I'm having a hard time weighing that against. There are people that have spoken that bought homes in an area where they have a certain expectation. And I strongly feel that that expectation is um, not just getting massaged, but it, it, has, it has the possibility of getting obliterated. And I have a hard time with that. Uh, I think it's, it's more than just a couple squeaky wheels. I feel like we have had members from Acorn Lane, from Newcomb Ridge, and I forgot the other uh, road but somebody else has, has spoke. And I'm having a hard time reconciling public benefit in that sense and the, co the public cost. And I think that there's a strong possibility that uh, we're costing somewhere between two and seven residents, we're costing them their house. And that, so I'm having a hard time. And then I think as I think ahead, I look at the final project, and I do think the final project is made in very good faith. I think they've done a, they've done as much as they can do as far as design is concerned. Hmm. So, when I say I'm curious about other people's comments, <coughs> because I don't know what else Piper Shores can do. I I can't. I I feel like the plan is as good as it's going to get. So I don't have something that I can offer up to Piper Shores to say if you do this then you're changing my mind. Hi, Jim. That was more. Good. That was good. Right. <laughs> you want to hear some more? Yes. <laughs> All right. I, I mean, I would, I would, I agree with much of what you have to say, and that's the thing that I uh, struggle with is taking this land out, out of RF and, um, putting it into something that people uh, who are the abutters didn't realize potentially could go in there because contract zones, as you know, drive me crazy, but that's another point. However, that being said, I'm always one to throw out, well, maybe if, and maybe if, and is there a way to come to some sort of a, I hate to use the term win-win because it's overused sometimes, but there is, is there some way to come to the middle where it may make sense for folks and for the town as a whole. And my big thing, of course, is public benefit. So I listed out that what I would consider is, and, and I bear with me, I can't remember if it's 52 units. 52. I want it, that's it, 52 units, none of this waffling, none of this, oh, we may put in more or whatever. Eh, 52, that's it. Um, that piece of land uh, that's up and back, and I wish I had the map here, but it's near where the rabbits run and the, and the whatever, be put into conservation, permanent conservation. Um, I'd like to see a substantial increase to affordable housing donation. I want to see help with the sidewalk con connectivity uh, that would help your, the, the other so-called other, other part of the campus as well as I'd say all the way down to Higgins Beach, if possible. Um, and, and this is just me, and I know it may not make sense, but I know that <clears throat> um, Piper Shores takes private pay rehab. I would love to see you make available some main care rehab where possible, particularly for residents of Scarborough. Um, but that's some of the things that I'd be willing to throw out there as potential um, moving me off the spot. So, that's where I'm at. Katie? Um, I'll jump on Jean Marie's bandwagon because I was starring things on my list that she uh, mentioned as well. So I don't have to necessarily go through them all um, in detail. But I do want to just give the caveat. So the, the danger for me in, the, in having these conversations and what I always worry about is that if I say X, Y, and Z, then somehow someone, my words come back and get spit back to me that, well, you said if I do this, this, and that, that you're a yes. And I want to be clear that this isn't 
that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not committing to a yes vote. I'm telling you what things could be included that would make it a much more attractive uh, possibility to me. Um, because I think as counselors, we get put in that position an awful lot, and I don't think that that's necessarily right, because we obviously, if something is going to happen, we want to make it the best we can mm -hmm. have, so you want to have some voice. Mm -hmm. So um, so I would, uh, going right down the list, the conservation land is absolutely imperative to me. On top of that, I, would, I think the original plan had somewhere around seven or eight parking spots for the public to use to access those trails. I'd like to see that increased. Um, that would, to me, show true public benefit because if I go there to walk the trails and those spots are never available because visitors are taking those spots, um, then it's not really a public benefit to be able to access. Um, I Inclusive affordable housing is really important to me, and I know many people have, developers and any other projects have pushed back and said, we can't do that, we can't figure this out. Well, Rocky's going to figure it out in the downs, and I just don't accept that answer. I get that the Piper Shores has a different business model, but perhaps I also know that individual contracts can be written differently. So it could be housing, but not the services that go with the housing, not the continuum of care piece. There are ways around, there are creative ways to think around about affordable housing. I know there are discussions around the in lieu fee being increased. It hasn't officially happened. Um, so that's something I'm pretty passionate about. Um, I hadn't thought about the main care rehab, but I love that uh, as well. Um, and I know that there's been meeting space offered in the past, but again, I think it's it's really been uh, somewhat reclusive. So if there was senior, like the seniors get to go down to Mark's Point using meeting space, making some space available for you know public meetings or something, that might be an appealing public benefit. I don't know what the clubhouse is, is geared to look like. Um, sidewalks, connectivity, you mentioned. Uh, and potentially a contribution to starting a fund for the community center that we all dream about happening in 20 years. Those things would be really appealing to me. And when you have contract zone, it's the one opportunity to ask for things that might seem out of the box. But that would be the laundry list of things that I think could make this look like a shiny object. <laughs> So I can definitely share new thoughts. Um, so thank you, everybody, for uh, what they. I just want to clarify, and I don't know if anybody here, or maybe somebody can shout it out in the. Um, the residents at Piper Shores, um, 62 and older, or 65 and older. Two. 62. Thank you. Sorry, it's just a reference point I needed in my head. Um, so I, I think everyone's kind of touched upon a little bit of everything that I like, um, and I and I like paul i look at what's the public benefit and he, i think he hit a home run in kind of explaining that um the in addition to that i think you need to look at um the demographic that this popular or this project and even the original project brings to this community is, is desperately needed um and i from and i when i say the demographic piece it's about the um the age concentration um to this community um and if you think about density i don't miss i do not have a problem with the density um, of this particular project um, and the reason, um, and I think back actually to my stepfather, who was a huge influence. He served 50 years in my hometown. And the first thing he said about planning was that if you don't like what your neighbor does on their lot, then buy it, buy because it. otherwise it's none of your business. And so while I'm not saying that it's none of the neighbor's business, but the fact is that the neighbor has a right to build on his lot um, with some authorizations that we all can provide or, or that we all have to take into consideration. I'm not saying that we need to approve it. Um, it's just that they have a right to build on that no differently than anybody else. And by the way, think about where we've been as a community. 90% um, of this community was probably RF um, 30, 40 years ago. And our houses where we live, I can tell you where I live, would never have been built if we had the, the perception or the belief that um, because it was zoned X when someone else bought it, it can never be rezoned because somebody else wants to do something different. Um, and I live right off the Eastern Trail, and that would have that that was all hunting ground for a lot of uh, young guys and gals in this town, for fox and rabbit. Um, so I kind of bal I'm balanced on that particular issue. Um, the, the real bigger issue that I think that I have with this isn't really I think it's you know the public benefit, the sidewalks, the fund issue around affordable housing. I don't buy into the um, 
the suggestions that we need to influence their business model and who they take in for residents. I think it's um, admirable to suggest it. I just don't think that that's right. Um, I have a bigger issue because it impacts the town, and that's the current relationship regarding the tax appeal. Um, that can be explained if people don't know what that is, but it has to do with their classification of their business um, and an overpayment of taxes over several, several years. And what that does to this particular, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a relationship issue that needs to be balanced. That does not mean I will not approve this. So I, uh, I liked all the ideas. It's a long laundry, you know, a long list of items uh, to consider. Uh, and I, I think they were all uh, good ones and well reasoned. Uh, there's still two missing pieces for me. I, I think we're way too easy on contract zones. I don't know that there is a remedy for where we are and how this one got here, but I want to, and this is a task for the council, not for Piper or you know, the folks who live there, but uh, I would like to see you know, us work on our, uh, the ordinances so that you know, we you know, we close what I view as a loophole there, uh, and having people arguing an amendment when it should be an application process. Uh, so that that is, no matter what happens, I, I really want to see uh, us do something there. Uh, the other thing is we've done a lot of talking about what we'd like, you know. Uh, none of us live there. So, uh, you know, our laundry list is great, but the folks that about it, uh, I think somehow, some way, uh, there's got to be some feedback from them and a reaction to the laundry list. So I know I've had conversations with uh, a couple of the groups, two of the three groups, and you know, uh, for a long time. And I think one group in particular is quite, quite uh, adamant about the fact that uh, uh, there would really be nothing that would uh, sway them to be, you know, lean more favorably toward this. Mm -hmm. So. But that said, I still, uh, you know, I, uh, we need to hear them and we need to see some sort of uh, shift in opinion or some softening in terms of uh, how they feel about it uh, without us acting unilaterally. Bill? I, I won't repeat. I agree with what many of you have, have said. Uh, there's obvious significant public benefits and compatibility with the comprehensive plan. If we decide that this is appropriate, and, and, the, and this is nothing more than a reiteration of what we heard uh, previously from Jay Chase, and our, so I was fine with that. Uh, it seems to me there's uh, a whole series of things that would make this uh, really an, uh, uh, an acceptable Piece. Uh, uh, the uh, it was critical when we got started many many months ago that that there be substantial landscape buffering so that uh, this was going to be a quality project that would uh, protect the visual aspects of. Uh, uh, impairment that the neighbors were in. They've, they have agreed to that. I've looked at it. We've all looked at the site plan <coughs> review, so that's, that's been, been dealt with. I was okay with the uh, density. Uh, it's residential use, whether it's RF or it's this contract zone. People are living there. The number of people who are going to live there is about the same. It's somewhere around 75, 80. Uh, one group's going to be a very senior group. The other group is going to be younger families. Uh, I think the comment made by one of the counselors that 52 is enough is correct. I think that would be my take on it, that uh, there be no further expansion of the project beyond that. Uh, I think the fact that... Uh, Piper Shores has now made a trails commitment that looks like a, a full commitment. Uh, 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 and if they can marry that with land conservation for the area in the back, that I think uh, is something that's very achievable. Uh, things that were important to 
some of the abutters. I know Acorn Lane talked about sidewalks. Uh, I think uh, sidewalk or an improved uh, shoulder between Acorn Lane and the market where the crosswalk is, is a good idea. Uh, and I would support it. I think maybe a contribution from uh, Piper Shores to that endeavor, but it ought to remain in the hands of the Town Council, through the Finance Committee, through the uh, CIP budget review, uh, and through Public Works, and the Town Manager doing an analysis of what makes sense out there. Uh, and so, yes, I would like to see a contribution made by uh, Piper Shores to it, but I would leave it to the town to make the call on what happens. And I would support uh, ACORN because I think it is a real benefit uh, to that, that whole area in terms of public safety. Uh, resolving the tax status of uh, the Piper Shores uh, uh, Holbrook House is critical. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, whenever you're dealing with that issue, and we are dealing with the taxability of this whole project. It was in the initial draft prepared by Piper Shores and presented to us. Uh, it is an amendment to the existing uh, contract zone, which includes the uh, uh, existing facilities, including Holbrook House. So it certainly seems to me to be appropriate to be on the table. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think you, have, you can be unfair about it. Uh, and uh, I would be guided by the good judgment of the six of you, plus uh, our lawyers, a good counsel on, on what would be appropriate under the circumstances. But I would see those as manageable issues that would go in any final draft, and that uh, uh, those would be amendments, uh, and it would be up to the Shores to decide whether that was acceptable. Uh, we, uh, we may be able to have them come to the table with those suggestions, but uh, if not, I, I would be happy to vote for something that included those provisions. And, and I think for me, really just echoing a lot of what's already been said, I'll just go over them quickly. One, I, my first hurdle is really getting over, is it consistent with the comprehensive plan because of the zoning of rural, and is there su sufficient public good? Having said that, the density issue seems to be a common issue that goes across. I certainly support no more than 52. Would love to see maybe less than 52, which I think would go a long way to, to for the abutters. Two, I, um, I, I too agree that the tax issue is critical to get resolved as part of this, this conversation. Um, I'd like to see something done with the affordable housing. I, I'd prefer to see it be inclusive. If not inclusive, I, I, I don't think a $20,000 in lieu fee is adequate. I would like to see something different. Um, I support the conversation, the conservation land on that back lot that kind of abuts up to the trail system out behind with more parking. There, I have sometimes parking at some of these parks is an issue. Um, and two, I'd, I'd love to have Piper Shores maybe reach out to the abutters and the abutters reach out to Piper Shores. I'd love them to be more supportive of the project. I don't know what that means. I guess they could decide what, what that is. But those are things that sort of are on my list, which I think is pretty consistent. The intent of this, Tom, I don't know if you're ready, but I, will, I wrote down where I think there's consensus among all of us. Um, and then we'll look to see whether we captured where we think consensus is or not. One is there is certainly an issue around density, the current plan density, certainly heard 52 and no more. Um, we certainly heard the tax appeal as being an issue that needs to be resolved one way or another. I guess there's several mm -hmm. ways to get that done. Um, talk conversations around sidewalks. Mm -hmm. um, conversations about some accommodation for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think we heard some about abutters, or at least mm -hmm. an olive branch to the abutters to see what it would take in the conservation land. Tom, did you hear other things that were kind of a consensus among the group? <clears throat> no, I, I would characterize those. There were others, mm -hmm. but I think those five items were in common with nearly every speaker, yes. And certainly speak up if, if they weren't. 
Does that yeah. resonate? Yeah, the, the trail and uh, conservation land kind of go well, hand in hand. I think the, the, we heard the abutters say they, they didn't want to have anything put out there and then have the risk of losing. I think there has to be some assurance that it's, this is it, it's going to be here, uh, and it seems to be located in an area that was not proposed for initial development of the 52 units to begin with. So why not bite the bullet and put it into uh, some sort of conservation trust? Hmm. We talked about the land, but are you saying too that the, the trails are, are locked down as being permanent on that land and won't be moved? And is, yeah. is that is that your yeah. point about yeah, that? Yeah, that, okay. that obviously if, if somebody came in and said, we've got a, a better way to uh, circumvent a wetland area, the town council would have the ability to right. to agree to that, uh, and agree to any proposed change, but it would have to be by agreement. Uh, it would not be within the discretion of Piper Shores. And uh, I was glad to see some of those changes because the thing that uh, I think gets missed when we're, because we're so critical of contract zones, and rightly so, mm -hmm. we, f we sometimes forget to say, Piper Shores is a terrific community within our community, and and they they should not feel a lack of recognition of that. This is really a terrific place, and and nationally known. So I want that right out there that we appreciate who they are and what they contribute to our community. So going back to that list as we read them off, is everybody comfortable? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. I think it doesn't sound like there's any. There, there's great detail around anything but the density, uh, but at least you've framed the, art, the, the right. issues that need some more work. Yep. Now, Councillor Donovan uh, suggested one path, which is the council to do things by amendment, and Piper Shores can consider that and do what they will. Uh, I'd like to think that we could get together with them and address these issues mm -hmm. to see what sort of progress we could make to see if there's a mutual understanding that we can come to. Cooperation first is always the best approach. Yeah. So that's what I so, intend to do, and I'm well, pleased to have others participate in that conversation, too. So, so there's a question on the table, which one are those methods? I mean, are we all comfortable with Tom's recommending that there's a conversation directly with Piper Shores to see Absolutely. if we can Absolutely. get some middle ground? Communication is not one way. And I'm pleased to have anyone else part of that, too, if, if any member of council wants to be part of those. Okay. Okay. Anything else on this issue? If, if not, we have about 10 minutes. If there's anybody that, after listening to this, has any questions or wants to make... Uh, I'm sorry, Sean. No, no. Scratching oh. my head. Oh, scratching your head. I'm trying to stay <laughs> awake. Um, so if anybody would like to come to the podium and if they have any questions or comments, sorry. public comment, we'd welcome that at this time until 7 when we convene our, our normal meeting. And if anybody doesn't get a chance to speak, they can, they can speak in the, in the public comment section of uh, the top of the agenda of the meeting. And again, we try to keep it to three minutes. So, my name is Barry Tibbetts. I live at 12 Berry Road in Scarborough. Um, I wasn't able to be at your earlier workshop prior to this, but um, one thing I did want to share that I, I after listening to you, I, I really like the idea, which I came to, to share with you again to, to share tonight about, is about the affordable. Uh, in, in, aspect of uh, providing housing for folks who live perhaps here in Scarborough that will never have the means to be able to live in Piper Shores because they just don't have that kind of money, but to take whether it's five or ten units and set it aside that residents who live in Scarborough can live in this facility based on what their income is as opposed to what they, what Piper Shores mm -hmm. considers to be for their profit margin or, 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 or what their standard fees are. Because uh, many, many of us who have, all, we all have parents, but some of us, as our parents get older, they get dementia, they get Alzheimer's, and, they, and it becomes quite a burden to a certain extent to take care of them. But prior to that, being able to put them into some kind of housing uh, is really beneficial before they get to that point where they have to be on main care and, and move to a different kind of facility. So my suggestion to you is because it's a contract zone and you clearly have the power with a contract zone to do whatever you want, I, I think you need to be really um, 
quite demanding on the side of creating affordability and make it in inclusive. I, I don't like the idea of putting money into a fund and let's put the affordable folks way over here on the other side of town. Mm. Mm. I don't think that's right. I think if you're going to do affordability, you, you mix them. Mm. And I think that's important and I think everybody wins from that perspective. I think it's a great project. I, I think it provides great tax relief across the board. It's going to, it's going to provide tax relief for me out in, West, in, in, in North Scarborough because they're going to be paying a lot of taxes and that's going to lower the operating costs of town, which keeps my taxes low. That's great. I just think you need to, to be really push that affordable side. I think that needs to be a really major component. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. You can, you can come up to the <clears throat> Anybody that does want to speak, if you kind of line up, it would be, it might be a little easier, a little quicker. <clears throat> Your name and address. Of course. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Lewis. I live at 15 Drake Lane uh, on the Piper Shores property. Uh, I want to address several things. I could address many, but I want to speak about uh, citizenship and the trail system. Uh, Piper Shores, I think we have to understand, I'm very grateful for Councillor Donovan's uh, remarks, stands as a model of corporate citizenship that few can equal. It makes significant and more importantly continuing contributions to entities like the Scarborough Library, the Land Trust, Camp Ketcha, among many others. Beyond Scarborough, it supports theaters and symphony and regional food banks, history museums, all of the important cultural th things that make Maine so important to residents like myself who uh, comes from away. Just <coughs> as important as this ethos of good corporate citizenship is that it fosters good resident citizenship. Piper Shores residents are enormously energetic and generous. We contribute money to many local education uh, organizations. We uh, contribute to all the organizations I've mentioned above. We give to uh, homeless shelters and hospitals. We volunteer at schools at the Portland Airport. Uh, our woodworking shop uh, and m our members of the woodworking shop build benches and signs for Camp Ketchum and uh, Scarborough Land Trust. Moving on to recreation access, I think there is an important trail system on this property and many have mentioned it, many of the abutters have mentioned it, but they haven't mentioned that it's really a quiet secret, only open to those in the know, it's private. And those owners uh, who abut the property apparently are in on the secret. Through access, though this access to the trails is limited today, it should be understood that Piper Shores will maintain these trails in perpetuity. It will open them to everyone. It will enable the trails uh, to connect between basically Higgins Beach and Libby Marsh. Walkers, country, uh, cross-country skiers, snowshoers will have a public access to these trails and will be able to connect with the Scarborough Land Trust. And right now what we have are uh, many residents of Scarborough who are welcome to our property. I see them every day. They, they come on cross-country skis, they fish from our rocks in the uh, summer and fall, they enjoy even our gardens and sitting on our benches. <coughs> they are welcome. This property, uh, which we are proposing, will continue that. And so we are good citizens, and it's important to re remember that. And finally, let me just say that we're cons we are citizens who will be contributing half a million dollars of basically free money to the town. We make no demand on the services, and that should certainly be taken into consideration. A person has said uh, <coughs> recently, one of the members of the workshop said, 
we uh, have heard from the abutters, but we haven't heard from the other citizens of Scarborough. It would be interesting to know what the citizens, other citizens of Scarborough would think if the council <coughs> turns down basically a half a million dollars in free money. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to be very brief. Um, I was inspired to speak by the fellow who talked about um, the need for something, um, need for affordable housing. Um, my husband and I recently split up, which puts me into that situation. And I was living in a cottage, and I'm going to be moving to a smaller apartment because of that. Piper Shores has the ability to do that for me, so I don't have to move out, um, and, and they're making it affordable for me to stay there. So I just want to say that that happens. I'm not the only person that that's happened before. So it, mm. that's part of the nonprofit aspect. Thank you. You can just, <laughs> just name and address. Make sure I wasn't cutting it yeah, yeah. somebody. <laughs> My name's Don Simino. I live at Fort Lucum Ridge. Been there forever. Um, I have no doubt Piper Shores is a wonderful organization. All the wonderful things listed off uh, by the previous speaker. Great, and I feel they should keep on doing it down there at Piper Shores, where they've already had some amendments to their original um, contract zone, and now they're looking for a new contract zone amendment in an area that's not even doesn't even belong to them yet. That isn't part of that footprint. I say give them all the amendments they want; they can have that all day long. But this is RF zone. This is where we live. I know a lot of folks don't care about the abutters, but we stay there because we thought we were protected by our two acre lots. Uh, <laughs> and I'm thinking about the density of this thing coming in here. It just, it just doesn't make any sense to me for, for tax revenue. I mean, it's just you're going to destroy this area. <clears throat> if Piper Shores can keep doing what they're doing, or they can expand somewhere where it's zoned for this, that would be. <coughs> I'm not liking it right there. It just doesn't make any sense to me. That's all I can say about it. I mean, it's, just, it it's not right. It's just not right. <coughs> Thank you. Would anybody else like to come to the podium? What time is it? Three minutes. Good evening. My name is Bob Ulack. I live at Six Newcomb Ridge. Um, Thank you for having us tonight. I appreciate it. I'm just going to read a letter that I had sent to the town council yesterday, um, and, and I appreciate some of the comments tonight. Uh, before I read this, if I recall, the 52 versus 61, it was always going to be 52, according to Piper Shores, and the 61 was just something they were going to ask for and later on down the road go for it. Um, my concern is, based on what I'm hearing tonight, is maybe people might con consider that a compromise, 62 versus the 50, excuse me, 61 versus the 52. That's, that's when Jim was in my, in, my, in my kitchen, he always said to me it was going to be 52. The 61 is just in case, but it's a guarantee. Of, well, I'm not going to use that word guarantee. I'm, I'm not sure quite exactly what he said. But 50, 52 was going to be the number. So when I, when I hear the council tonight talk about maybe a way to get, get, get past go, when they say 52, we haven't gone anywhere in our mind. Um, it's, it's a big concern for us. 52 is compared to 16 or 18 is a major number, not even close. I'm, 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 I'm worried we're getting to a stage where we're, we're talking about how do, we, how do we get this work, how do we get this to work for Piper Shores? And, and no one's talking about how do we get this to work for the abutters. That's, that's a concern for us. I, I, I think it's unfair. Um, um, we've always said, Piper Shores has the right to ask. The abutter has the right to sell. I mean, excuse me, the homeowner, the, the property owner has the right to sell. But does that give the council the right to say, hey, how do we make this work? And, and I just ask to rethink about what we've been talking about. With that said, I'm just going to read this just to, I'm sure people read it last night, just going to read the letter. I'm going to probably go over my three minutes. I apologize. We as residents of Newcomb Ridge would like to thank you again for the opportunity allowed us at the January 9th meeting. The meeting was candid, informative, as well as collaborative in process. However, the Piper Shores 
proposal demonst still demonstrates flaws. We remain certain that the project is not compliant with the contract zone section of the zoning ordinance, with the current RF zoning district, nor the town of Scarborough's comprehensive plan. Any further discussion on our part as Newcomb Ridge residents would be redundant at this time, whereas we are all aware, of, you guys are all aware of our viewpoints. We have said many times, how we got to this point, how did this happen? At the January 9th meeting workshop, more than one council member or planning board member expressed those same thoughts, probably why we're here tonight. Based on letters from the Scarborough Town public comment section to the council from a handful of Piper Shores residents, it would appear that Piper Shores is asking themselves that same question. However, we suspect for different reasons. For us, it appears we have come full circle, starting with the initial process as to how the project was introduced to the town and the abutters. Re tax revenue to the town and a sense of entitlement from the applicant. Process. The process applicable to a new contract zone versus an amended contract zone. A new contract zone requires a meeting consisting of the town council, planning board, and the abutters. The amended contract zone does not require this meeting and allows the first reading or proposal to be heard only by the town council. If the town council approves the first reading, they move the proposal along to the planning board for their review. <coughs> by no means does this action guarantee final approval to the applicant. Piper Shores has elected, had elected to go the amended contract route with a parcel of land they do not own, separate from any existing property. This, in our view, is the biggest reason why we are, how did we get to that stage? We suspect there have been a few hundred thousand dollars spent on Piper Shores Park without any final approval from the town. It is clear there is zero support from the abutter or neighbor or neighbors from the, both the Newcomb Ridge or Acorn Lane as well as many from the Stone Ridge area. Had Piper Shores proposed a new contract zone, a meeting would have taken place with the town council, planning board, and the abutters, leaving no doubt that this proposal would have been rejected right then and there, on all of our, <coughs> right then and there, based on all of our points that were expressed over the last few months. Tax revenue and a sense of entitlement. We have heard over and over again, especially recently, that Piper Shores is the, is the largest taxpayer in the town of Scarborough and that their project will add greatly to our pocketbook. Some recently described them as cash cows. Does that entitle Piper Shores to a free building permit anywhere they want in the RF zone district of this town? We certainly believe otherwise. The continued suggestion that Piper Shores has and will have lesser tax revenue spent on the town's, our school system, or public works department is somewhat accurate, but is inconsequential, especially if it is looked upon as a benefit to the town. If this is a town prerequisite for new development, then projects that do overly, bur overly burden our school system and public works departments, such as Eastern Village, would not exist as they stand today. The town of Scarborough should, be looking, should not be looking for ways to accommodate Piper Shores for reasons money spent, added tax revenue to the pocketbook, or a sense of entitlement from the applicant for being the largest taxpayer in this town. We ask the town of Scarborough to adhere to the requirements of the current RF zone ordinance, stay the course of the comprehensive plan, Please protect us from this out of character size development and deny Piper Shores the application unequivocally. We very much appreciate your dedication and thoughtful consideration, respectfully, the residents of Newcomb Ridge. Um, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, we'll take one more uh, and, then, and then we'll adjourn. Uh, first, thank you all for uh, the work you're doing. And it was the, sitting through the last uh, workshop was very. I really appreciate the thought you guys have been giving to this and hearing our concerns. I do want to stand here. Um, I'm on um, Stone Ridge Drive. Again, my name is Bobby Enchin, 9 Stone Ridge. I'm here with one of my neighbors. <clears throat> We're the three that are on wells that, <clears throat> from the uh, Portland Water District, there is really no remediation because of the ledge. We already have all borderline water supplies. I just want to keep that on your radar because uh, it's a very challenging issue for us up there. That, and also the fact that we're all sitting right on that ledge uh, that if any blasting occurs, that we're going to see damage from that. So just wanted to keep that, keep that in your front of mind. Thank you. Actually, based on that last comment, just a question for the council. That, that issue of wells has come up. Is that something there's a consensus that should be addressed in sort of the, the issues that we had identified? I, I think I, the planning board brought it up, yeah. too. But, yeah, I mean, it needs to 
make sure that they've got the right analysis done of impact on wells? Yeah. So is there is there a consensus that that's that's reasonable? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. So with that, we will close out this workshop and convene to our normally scheduled town council meeting. Oh, okay. Well, it's a good good time for a bio.
10 years of being on the council, you get a special um, glance. Yeah, I was wondering if you bring up neighborhood issues. You get to see all the ghosts <laughs> standing in the back of the room. <laughs> all the families pass. Yeah, yeah. 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 All I can say, okay. Good evening, everybody. I want to call the, the town council meeting of February 6th to order. We apologize for being a little late. As you probably saw, we had a workshop just prior to this that there was just a couple comments that we wanted to take. So with that, we'll start the meeting with a call to order and the Pledge of the Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, with that roll call. Councilor Bayvine. Present. Councilor Johnson. Here. Councilor Foley. Here. Councilor Caterina. Here. Councilor Donovan. Here. Councilor Hamill. Here. Chairman Hayes. Here. Um, the next item on the agenda is general public comments. And I think what we'll do at this point, I think there's lots in the audience that may have some interest in the co-op conversation. So any public comments that for any other agenda items can wait till we get to those agenda items but for the co-op or just general comments anybody that wants to come to the podium please come up and join us thank you again the the, the protocol is sort of give your name and address and then we do have posted up here sort of just the, the sort of decorum we expect at, at the podium from everybody thank you My name is Mike Doyle. I write for my website, FalmerToday.me. In the last 48 months, I've had 6.6 .6 million hits and 86,000 new readers. And I've done a number, numerous number of, excuse me, a very high number of stories about Scarborough and the uh, unbelievable misconduct that takes place here. Uh, in the Cusack case, which was just settled, uh, the uh, assailant to Andy Cusack, who beat him severely. He was facing almost 50 years for assault, aggravated assault, and elevated aggravated assault, theft, all sorts of things. Uh, it was just reduced down to a sentence of eight years with all but nine months suspended. And the nine months will be at the county jail where for every day you're good, you get a day off. So he'll be out of jail in four and a half months, basically. He'll be out by the end of May, beginning of June. The pivotal part of the entire pre-trial uh, hearing was Dr. Biswa's testimony about the heinous treatment that Cusack inflicted on this guy before he got beat up over a period of years. It was on, it, she went on for an hour and a half. It would make any man who listened to it skin crawl. That's how bad it was. The district attorney actually said to the judge, I'm concerned about jury nullification. And that's where the jury comes back and says, not guilty, no matter what the evidence is, no matter what the testimony is. And that's why the negotiation came down to a sentence of nine months and four and a half months to serve. He has three years of probation, and I, I think it was a fairly good outcome for what happened. But in another part of it, I was listening today to the testimony, and I took some notes of the police officers, most of which had 30 years experience in this town, walking into one perjury trap after another. If this had ever gone to trial, these, these police officers would have been in big trouble from their pre-trial hearing that they testified in. I don't know if Mr. Donovan was a litigator, but when a lawyer asks a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. It's usually because they do know the answer, and they want to see if the witness is stupid enough to lie about it. And these experienced police officers lied continuously. I've done part two of the story that's on my website right now about the Cusack case. I'm going to do part three and examine the perjury that I heard on the recording from the police department in the town of Scarborough. My last item is I met with a law firm today about a section 1983 lawsuit against you folks generated by Mr. Babine's behavior when he was uh, chairman and uh, Councillor uh, Donovan, when he was a member of the, of the council, standing right here almost a year ago this past November. And during that situation where I was arrested and taken to jail, uh, the law firm is looking at a series of de uh, deposition questions starting today from my 200-page book that I wrote about from the articles about Scarborough. So the town people sitting here eventually going to pay a ton of money in this lawsuit. 
because of this misconduct and taking me to jail and having me have to bail myself out. So you folks have planted a, a seed that you can't call back at this point. And the law firm is in the process of getting ready to file a lawsuit and uh, carry on from there. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so at this point, any other public comments, including comments on the co-op discussion, which will be later on the agenda this evening? My name's Dave Green. I live at 135 Beach Ridge Road. I'm down here to pick up the carpet for a little bit of dirt that's been swept underneath. And I will leave Councillor Johnson and Councillor Hamill out of this. The rest of you five people plus the town manager sitting up here, you need to listen to what I'm going to tell you. This town has lost a world-class research project with the University of New England to do research on milky ribbon worms. And the reason is because your shellfish committee in this town couldn't step up and give them some labor to do the surveys they needed. Now I heard five of you people sitting on this council when I was the chairman saying you wanted surveys. That's all UNE needed was some surveys to do the research work. This was a world class project, okay? And it's gone down the drain. I, I just, if any of you could give me an answer why that happened, please tell me. I'll give you the rest of my three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to come to the podium for public comment this evening? Good evening. My name is Travis Turner. I live at 40 Dunstan Landing Road. My grandfather was an original member of the uh, Pine Point Fisherman's Co-op, as well as my brother's godfather. Uh, personally, I've received several calls from concerned people since the leader story broke. Um, contrary to some of the rumors that opposition to this sale is personal, I can assure you it's not. It's not a result of what one family has done to another or what was said in the past, etc. This is a concern to most fishermen down there because it is the loss of their heritage. Most, if not all, of the fishermen down there have never known a day that the Fisherman's Co-op did not exist. At one point, all have depended on it when others couldn't provide what the Co-op did. If the Fisherman's Co-op is sold to private interest for the price being considered, it is without a doubt <coughs> going to mean the development on the restaurant side. Because let's be frank, flipping crates is not going to pay the income necessary to facilitate payment on that kind of loan. <clears throat> Therefore, it is extremely important for the collective majority of fishermen to ensure we express our concerns regarding the vital infrastructure requirements we rely on that are currently met by the presence of the co-op. We pray that should the sale of the co-op be approved, that it be with the relief to the fishermen as follows. We ask that the council consider ensuring on-site buying operations continuing year-round. Currently, Bailey's only buys from their two fishermen while their restaurant is operating. We ask that the council provide at least 75 barrel bait storage capacity to their fishermen on site. Currently, I personally store 20 barrels in the co-op, and I know of at least 10 full-time fishermen that do almost the same. Uh, we also ask that you consider ensuring no commercial access to piers launches will be hindered by restaurant activities or any other activities. We asked the guaranteed access to the dirt commercial parking lot on the on the, to the left of the co-op or the right of the co-op, depending on how you look at it. Um, we ask that that not be prohibited by any uh, activities which would, would change regarding the co-op. Um, we would ask you to allow commercial trucks of other lobster bait wholesalers to be granted access to the dirt parking lot. 
and to carry on buying and selling activities, including overnight storage in that area. We would also ask that you consider tabling the approval of the sale until any ordinances may be amended to allow for these or any changes to take place, ensuring healthy and uninhibited competition. And finally, we ask that you consider in the future the right of first refusal for any future sale to allow for the fishermen to reorganize a co-op in the future. Thank you for your time. Have a good night. Thank you. I'd like to speak again, if I might. I, I just heard the chairman of this council just please don't talk about things on the agenda. And what did we just listen to? Do you, can I come up here and talk about the co-op? Yeah, we, we announced what... Right what now? You, if you have some comments about the co-op, you can speak to it right now, yes. Well, I, you just said no. Wait I, until the agenda. No, I, no. no I, I, I misunderstood. Okay, well, no, I'll wait till it comes up. No, 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 no. We, this is... This is the time, this is the time. David, David. This is the time. We're, we're trying. Everybody's here. We thought had an interest. We said for this one agenda item, anybody that in the public comment section right now, anybody that had comments no, about I, the. I have nothing now. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Josh Cohen. Uh, I've been a resident of Scarborough for the last 25 years. That's the entirety of my life. Uh, all of that has been spent at One Irish Drive, Scarborough, Maine. Uh, I cannot speak to the uh, co-op nature of the business. Uh, that's not where my experience lies. I have been in the restaurant industry for the last five years of my life, and three of that has been spent working for uh, the Baileys over at the Bait Shed. While there, uh, I can say that they have run, if not one of the most efficient restaurants in Maine, I would be absolutely stunned. Um, I have not seen a restaurant that has been run more efficiently, nor been as uh, willing to work with their workers to make sure that things get done, but at the same time that their workers are happy and are comfortable in their living conditions and working conditions. Uh, while there, they pay fair wages, which I think is a fantastic thing, and more importantly, the quality of the business that they bring in also allows uh, servers, which is a primarily a tipped position, to make more money than at pretty much any other restaurant in the state. Um, I, I know that might not be an exact figure, but I don't know many other servers that I've spoken to in this industry, even those that work up in the more tourist-heavy areas, uh, that make the same kind of income that is possible based on the quality of the product that they put out and the consistency of the product that they put out. Uh, over that time, uh, I've lived in the Blue Point area. I, for those of you who aren't familiar with One Irish Drive, it's not quite in Pine Point, but it's about as close as I'm going to get. Um, in general, <laughs> yes, traffic is heavier, but at the same time, it's no heavier than I've seen my entire life. Uh, that's just the nature of the summers down in Scarborough. Uh, I find that they do a great job of managing the traffic flow there and that they do an excellent job of making sure that customers can get in and out in a timely manner without disrupting the day-to-day -day of the people that live down there. Uh, I know that I've never really had my commute disrupted uh, because of Bailey's and because of their business down there. Uh, it's been a great experience to work for them over the last several years, and I find that everything that they do, uh, they take a very good consideration of what their customer thinks to make sure that they're happy when they leave, and all of the reviews online show that. As a result, you know, being in business for 100 years in that location has helped put Scarborough on the map. And I think that they'll continue to do that as they are incredible citizens for this community. Uh, Bailey's um, the, uh, Bait Shed, it's home to one of the oldest lobster rolls in Maine. That is one of our claims to fame in this town. Uh, that's something I've known my whole life just because I've lived there my whole life. And I think it would be a fantastic thing to see them uh, continue to expand their business and bring another business uh, up and raise up the community as a result. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else this evening? Shelley Pelletier, and um, I work at JDHS Enterprises at 10 Snow Canyon Road in Scarborough. Um, I just want to say that for years, um, 
I've worked with both Sue and Vincent, and my father, Henry Pelletier, has worked with Sue's father, uh, Bill Bailey. As far as, um, as far as business owners, they, are, they, they know what they're doing. They've done it many times. Um, when they bought Conroy's garage and changed that whole corner and made that corner very attractive, they did so um, even at, the re at some request from the, from the town of Scarborough to what they had to do to that property. I think in their, in their fishing and restaurant industry, in their common sense, that they are two good people to purchase this property and to do what needs to be done to make this a working property that um, would only enhance that town, this town. Thank you. <coughs> All right, anybody? Oh. <laughs> if anybody else wants to speak, maybe kind of line up so it kind of goes Hi. a little Hi, my you. name is Allison Doobie. I wasn't gonna speak tonight, but I feel like I should. My family has worked for the Baileys for three generations now. My father worked there, I worked there, my daughter works there. My husband is a fisherman. His brother is a fisherman. His whole family came from a line of fishermen, so he's always sold at the co-op. Um, my impression is not that she wants to take this business and change it. She wants to keep it a working waterfront. She has done multiple things over, well, since I've known her, First of all, she was my friend before she was my boss because I used to go visit my dad at work. So she's always been very family oriented. Um, she, her whole family have been like really good stewards of the land. So they go above and beyond. Everything that they take, they kind of touch and turn to gold. If that's just, I mean, if you, it takes money to make money and I understand all that, but it also like everything that they do, um, when she went and rebuilt the lobster pound, she kept the historical aspects in mind when she did that. Um, they employ like a high number of people and they bring a ton of revenue around them. Um, they run their businesses very efficiently. They're environmentally friendly and they recycle a ton. Um, if someone else were to get, I mean, there were plenty of opportunities for other people to get the co-op. But not only does that, it's not just about them, it's about everything. So anyone can buy the co-op and do whatever they want with a co-op, but she actually wants to keep it a co-op. She wants to keep it so the local fishermen can sell. So I'm not really sure what else to say other than that she's, one of the best bosses I've ever had. She's so very involved with the community. She's family oriented. I enjoy going back year after year to work for her and so does the rest of my family. So with that being said, I just, they're great. And all of their businesses run well and she does a lot for this community. So thank you. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Stephanie Harmon. I live in South Portland. Um, I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of the Baileys and their endeavor to open Stern. Um, they are wonderful, caring, genuine people to work for. They care about the people they employ. I have always worked part-time in the restaurant business since college, in addition to being <coughs> a social worker. I would, they would never ask you to do anything they wouldn't be willing to jump in and do themselves. They are the face of their business. They are open. <coughs> They are there open to close and readily available. Um, it is clear that this is not a job for them, but their passion, and it shines through every day. The people they employ are some of the hardest working folks I've had the pleasure to work with. A lot of their employees have other careers or other jobs, but they keep coming back every season excited to be working for the Baileys. They streamline an efficient business model that many other business sh businesses should take a look at. They create revenue for the community, create many jobs for so many folks. They are successful in what they do because they love what they do. The community would only benefit from having them opening this business. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good
Good evening. My name is Stephanie Wilkinson. I reside in South Portland. Um, I've worked for Vinnie and Sue in a managerial position for a few years. They are trustworthy and fair. They operate a business that is honest and considerate to the community they are a part of. They offer good paying, paying jobs that support many local families. Thank you. Hi, my name is Adriana Bailey Nang. I live at Five Huntley Drive. I'm here as a supporter for Vinnie and Sue and their endeavor at the co-op. Um, again, I am an employee of Vinnie and Sue's. I have been for two years. Um, they are, I'm gonna repeat things that are gonna have already been said. They are two of the most hardworking people that I've ever worked for. I've worked in the restaurant industry for about 25 years and their standards are high. Um, their restaurants are clean, their employees are happy, their customers are happy. Um, I feel it would be beneficial to the co-op to have them run it, to have them own it. It would only be a benefit to the Pine Point community. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Mo Erickson. I live at 288 Pine Point Road. And um, I don't think we're debating the, um, the greatness of Sue and Vinny. I mean, I know they run a great business. I know they're honest people. I know they keep their customers happy. They keep their employees happy. That's, that's not what we're talking, I don't think that's the problem. I think what uh, the people in um, Pine Point, some of them, and, and the, the fishermen down in the, in the, at the co-op are, concerned about is that um, if they do purchase the building and they do get their $900,000 mortgage or whatever it may be, um, they're going to certainly do renovations. And um, I guess I'm just curious, you know, DeMillo started out small too. Not that we're going to end up with the DeMillos, but who's to say what's going to happen down the line? None of us have a crystal ball. And my real concern is that what are the recourses if they decide not to have a bait shed in the building? And if they decide, you know what, we prefer to buy our excess, 200, like they did last year, 200,000 pounds of lobster from the guys in Portland instead of the guys at the co-op. Where, you know, they don't want to buy their clams from the 30 clam diggers down the beach. Um, so my concern is then, what's the recourse then? I would like to have the council address that and explain what, what would we do then if they decided to do something totally different and where would the lobstermen and the fishermen be? Thank you. Thank you. So seeing no one stepping forward, I think I'll close public comment. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is to approve the minutes of January 16th. Motion for approval. So moved. Second. Any discussion, changes, edits? All those in favor? That was unanimous, thank you. Um, there are no adjustments to the agenda. I have signed the treasurer's warrants. So the next item of business is old business, item number 19005. Act on the names posted to the planning board as recommended by the appointments negotiation committee on January 16, 2019. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to the chair of that committee for any conversations, discussions. Yes, these are uh, appointments for the planning board. Uh, it's a second reading. This would con uh, confirm their appointments. Um, reappointing Robin Saunders as a full voting member with term to expire in 2021. Appointing Jennifer Ladd as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2021. And appoint Rick Meinking as a second alternate to fill a term to expire in 2019. <clears throat> Thank you. Is there any public comment on the proposed nominations? Seeing none, I close public comment. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. Any, any, all those, any discussion, comments? All those in favor? Unanimous. 
Um, the next item on the on the agenda is new business order number 19006, first reading in schedule of public hearing on the proposed amendments to chapter 901, the town of Scarborough garbage and recycling collection and disposal ordinance. Uh, Article 1, section 1 1.02. Section one, to, I, I don't necessarily need to read all those stories. So I, I think with that, I think Mike Shaw is in the audience to explain. Good evening, Mike. Right way to spend a Wednesday night, right? <laughs> Good evening. Uh, the changes to the, to the ordinance that uh, are being proposed are in the definition section. Um, Specifically, the definition of what yard waste is considered. Uh, that adds earth and fill, soil and sand. Uh, and then the other um, larger or, or noteworthy change to the ordinance is uh, a language change in section 1.10. Uh, the current, the current, the the, the current uh, ordinance reads that. Um, morning of collection and then it says should be removed by the towns uh, out of the towns right away on the same day uh, we'd like to change that to shall and the purpose behind that is simply that uh, it allows us to actually uh, request that that happens uh, there are instances where uh, a trash can in the way is, is a challenge for uh, people other folks trying to get in and out of their driveways and so forth and also it affects our operations as well um, Beyond that, that's, uh, that, that's the majority of the changes. Uh, so we're trying to find, we, we're just asking that the definition be changed of what yard waste is considered. Uh, I didn't mention why we're asking that. That is because uh, in the towns right away in the spring, during spring cleanups, lots of times folks rake material out into mm. the road. Mm. That becomes a challenge for us, especially when we've already been through with our street sweeping operations. Causes uh, more work and more cost for the department. So those are the two changes that we're asking to be considered uh, in this, uh, this this change to the ordinance. Does anybody have any questions for Mike Shaw? Yes. Is that mm -hmm. no? Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you your Mike. time. <clears throat> um, any public comment on what we just we just discussed? Seeing none. Um, motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any discussion comments? Anybody? No. Uh, they, they look like very sensible changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they're not a big deal, uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Shaw has pointed out some real value in, in making them a little stricter. Um, with that, so all those in favor? Again, that's unanimous. Thank you. Um, Next item on the agenda is 19007, act on the request from the town manager to direct the annual funds from the Pine Point parking lease to be deposited into the Pine Point Waterfront Reserve Capital Improvement Account. Tom, I don't know if you yeah. want to give I'll, I'll give some of the history and perhaps you can speak yeah, to the more yeah. recent events. Uh, this uh, so-called improvement fund was created <coughs> with funds left over from the construction of the, <coughs> of the pier project. Uh, it was thought at the time, or there was some question, what do we do with these funds? We want to make sure, I think it was uh, held and could be used for further benefit of the, the waterfront community, if you will. And so this reserve was uh, initially uh, created for that purpose. We've essentially spent that money down over time, uh, funded many capital projects at the parking lot, bought floats and, and other waterfront-related uh, activities. Uh, any monies left over in the marine resources account at the end of the year do flow back to this fund. Those are really small amounts at this point in time. And so as I understand, most recently the Coastal Harbors and Water Committee expressed an interest in having those uh, lease revenues from the uh, parking lease at the Pine Point Co-op uh, flow to this fund and, and uh, again be used for those general purposes. I would note the practical effect of that is currently that comes into our uh, general fund and helps offset some of our expenses uh, for staff, uh, seasonal staff and otherwise. So there'll be a deficit on the operating side. Uh, but uh, I'm sure these funds will be put to good use probably uh, through capital investments. And uh, as chair of the, or liaison to those <laughs> committees, you might have more insight. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's really as, as we've, you know, it, it, appropriately tonight as, as we're talking about the co-op was come to light is, yeah, there's a parking lease there. There's about a $5,000 annual 
lease of that fee. Um, there has been a lot of talk, as we said, that there's been a capital fund for the working waterfront, but these, these parking spots are in the working waterfront. And I know the, the, you know, the, the, the Coastal Harbor Committee has really been talking about trying to create a reserve fund for things like the cranes and the docks and really have sort of a dedicated account that they can use to maintain the working waterfront and what they need. So this is really kind of a housekeeping item to say that these funds probably appropriately should go to the Coastal Harbor sort of a reserve fund. Uh, that's the suggestion here tonight. Um, so with that, any, any public comment on that? <coughs> Seeing none, motion to approve. So moved. Any Second. discussion, any discussion comments? I had a question. So um, can these be used for purposes other than, I said clam seed fund for example, so can these funds be used for things other than capital improvements or replacing plates <laughs> or whatever? I mean, for example, could they be used for, uh, you know, milky worm studies or whatever, pay for labor for that, that kind of thing? Or is it just for capital uh, improvement or upkeep related things? Historically, the, the reserve fund has been used for capital investments that have gone through the annual budget process. Uh, there are occasions we should have ample resources in the operating budget to make uh, routine repairs. Um, on occasion, at a budget cycle, we'll come back. We're not authorized to spend reserve funds, so it would be council decision if that comes out of budget cycle. So uh, I guess to answer your question, we should have adequate resources in our operating budget to handle the expected expenses. This is really for the unique and higher cost okay. items. One off items. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Any other comments <coughs> or discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous, thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is 19008, an act on the request of the town council express the intent to form two ad hoc committees, a community center ad hoc committee and a downtown ad hoc committee, and direct the town manager to propose charges for each committee no later than September 4th, 2019. And Tom, do you want to give a sure, little bit I, of... Sure, I approached the uh, council chair and the vice chair uh, some weeks back uh, just to maybe remind everyone as part of the uh, conversation we've had with the Downs over the fall and early winter uh, there were a number of things that were kind of reserved for the future we kicked them down the road uh, we gave ourselves five years as a community to sort through and decide whether we wanted to further partner or have any interest in uh, in a further <coughs> partnership and that really fell in three categories one was conversation around a community center there's a partnership opportunity there that we want to pursue uh, there are there's a so-called downtown uh, that's still a bit nebulous, and we don't know what that is and whether all those things <coughs> make sense and whether we should play an active and financial role in that. That's another process. And a, a third one that was kind of late to the conversation was uh, they reserve space for a school site should uh, the Board of Education and the town think that that's the, the best approach long-term for this community. Uh, so I expect the Board of Education will pursue that on their own, but they have a similar five-year timeline. And so I approached the council chair and vice chair saying, you know, this council is the one that approved the TIF and the current enhancement agreement. It would be great for you to initiate this process. And frankly, I think we'll take probably a couple of years working through this. And I know the developer is interested in getting feedback and reaction sooner than later. And I think this is part of the, con uh, these conversations are really going to be interesting to have. And so this was really about kicking this off. Uh, I applaud the council chair by saying let's have a council action to make sure that everyone knows about it mm -hmm. so I'll be working over the next several months to, to flush this out I'm certainly open to input uh, but those in the communities be uh, in the community be thinking uh, about potentially serving on one or more of these committees uh, as part of this process will be to actually appoint members uh, to serve uh, uh, this ad hoc purpose and uh, I think it's great that we're gonna get started on this thank you Motion to approve the act. So moved. Second. Any discussion, comments, questions? Council okay. uh, So will, will these, uh, the, will the staffing for these committees fall under the responsibility of the appointments committee? I mean, will we be looking for help uh, in that way or will it be some other process for this? Typically it's been full council appointment, but uh, these ad hoc, as the name suggests, uh, there's nothing really certain about this. We can, uh, we can do it however you wish. Great. Appointments may be a fine way of doing Great. it. Uh, I think it'll be really important to find uh, committed people, ideally with some expertise. And so the more we talk about this early and often, I think the better. 
I do expect we'll need, we're going to need some professional support for these committees too uh, to do a thorough job. Well, I'd like to add also. I just think I'm encouraged by this: the fact that we're moving it up and making it a priority so quickly, you know, within a much broader time frame. That's very promising. So, you know, appreciate sure. the initiative here and putting it at the top of the list. Councilor Foley. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm super excited about the possibility that of both of these committees and likewise I'm pleased that we're getting started sooner than later because I think sometimes you can have the greatest idea in the world but if you don't start you know setting some goals and getting things into action nothing happens and we could very easily look back in three years and go oh god that's right we were supposed to start talking about that and getting making some movement and we hadn't done that yet so I'm super happy about that hmm. thanks cool <laughs> oh wait did I say that out loud anybody else did Councilor yeah, just to echo what uh, Katie and Don said, I wholeheartedly agree. And just for the public, Tom just said this, but just to reiterate, the Community Center Ad Hoc Committee is actually part of our agreement with the Downs. So um, the agreement we entered with the developers is we would we would do this, and I'm, I'm happy to see we're doing this sooner rather than later. So. Thank you. Sean, did you add Council Bateman? No, it's no. fine. I mean, the only thing I would add, too, is I think this is somewhat, this was sort of a similar process we used for the public safety building, where there was an ad hoc committee that really invested stakeholders across the community, and it really drove a, a pretty good process by which they, they got a lot of buy-in from the community. It was a successful project, so I'm also excited about this conversation starting to work. Anybody else have any other, anything? All those in favor? Unanimous. That's great. <coughs> um, the next item on the agenda is a non-action item, and again, it it's, might feel a little awkward, but what we're trying to do in this in this piece is really have a conversation. Much if anybody was here for the workshop earlier this evening, the intent is really for us as a town council to discuss the proposal about the, the co-op, and we've had a workshop on it, but it really is a conversation about really trying to get greater clarity, some consensus among us as town council members about the types of things that would be important for us to at least talk about and, and try to get as part of the <coughs> conversation going forward. Um, I think with that, Tom, I think you have some introductory yeah, I, remarks. I, and I do. Uh, I beg your pardon. In terms of setup, I, I originally thought we'd be around the table, but they've taken all of our microphones. <laughs> and frankly, I think the public probably benefits from us here uh, just in terms of the audio. So. We do have a guest this evening, uh, Attorney Peter Van Hemmel. He's with Bernstein Schur, uh, the town's attorney. Uh, he's his, he specializes in real estate law, and we've had the occasion to get him engaged in this matter and uh, start to sift through the decades of history mm -hmm. and, uh, and intrigue and complication in some respects. And so we've invited Peter here to help uh, uh, respond to some of the written materials he's provided to the council that were in your packet and available for the public's view as well and to really have a, a, be able to use him as a resource as you start to uh, consider what the town's rights and obligations and uh, the best approach might be. So, Pete, if I could, could I ask you to take the podium and be willing to stand there as long as we want you to be? <laughs> yeah. I'd ask Pete, Pete as, to... As long as the microphone goes down low enough for me, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pete, that, I'd ask you right? to perhaps start by giving us an overview of, of your preliminary research, and that might be a good place to start. Sure. Thank you. So, so good evening, ladies good and gentlemen evening. of the council. Um, I apologize. I'm trying to get over a cold here as well, so if it sounds like I'm about to sneeze. Forgive me. Uh, so I, I prepared this memorandum, and I, I trust the council's had a chance to review it. Um, there's one I, I need to make a small technical correction, which I'll get to when I go through it uh, briefly. But... What I tried to do is provide a, a general overview taken from a historical perspective of what we know from the available documents. There are additional documents out there, and one of them is referenced early on in this memorandum, which is uh, there are minutes from the town council, or I guess it would have been the board of selectmen in uh, 1964, which refer to an interesting document which is described as a writ of mandamus. Mm -hmm. Those are comparatively rare in modern times. Um, it is a, a court proceeding where somebody is seeking to make a public official or body uh, take a particular action to, to do or not do something. And this 
stemmed from a court case. There's, there are some references to it in media articles, which the council may have seen. Uh, but the actual court order is something that we continue to seek. Court records from this date are actually sent by the county courts to the main state archives. Mm. And so the process to retrieve such a record from the main state archives is highly bureaucratic. Okay. Uh, we've been at it for several weeks. Um, they have come back and said, can you please you know, summarize this and prepare this letter and get this form from the court? We have processed these requests as fast as they have come to us, but we still do not have a copy of the writ of mandamus from 1964 as of this morning. Um, what I am hopeful of doing is having one of my uh, paralegals actually walk to the archives to try and <laughs> buttonhole an archivist to see if we can accelerate this process, but we have let them know that uh, we're trying to uh, conduct a public process and reference to this order uh, would be helpful. That would be important if this order issued in 1964 and binds the town of Scarborough, there may be something in it which is still binding on the town of Scarborough. Um, I'd like to see what that order says. It's likely that the deed or deeds which issued in 1964 fulfilled the writ of mandamus and that everybody is in compliance with that writ or the process that generated it probably would have informed us as to the insufficiency of the acts in 1964, that something was done or not done, and the writ would not have, have uh, sort of disappeared from view. Some further action would have been taken on it. But I can't know that for sure until we see the writ. So <coughs> presumably there was some process, some court process in 1964, which compelled the town of Scarborough to issue a deed and that deed issued in 1964 uh, from the town to what was called the Pine Point Cooperative Association, which granted to that entity the outright ownership of this land. There's been some correspondence about whether the, uh, the recital of consideration, as it's called, the amount of money that was exchanged at $1 as recited in the deed, whether that has significance or not. In my practice of real estate, I tend to discount the importance of that because uh, you do not always put a price tag in every document which describes all of the consideration. You can say for $10 and other good and valuable consideration and sort of keep the business off the page of the public records. Um, but it may well have been done for $1 for, for sort of a, a, a nominal amount of consideration uh, in furtherance of the order, the writ of mandamus. I don't know. Um, but in any event, the deed which issued in 1964 states that the town is conveying the land at issue in this transaction for $1 to the Pine Point Cooperative Association. I made some attempt to try and track down what was the Pine Point Cooperative <coughs> Association. And the Secretary of State maintains corporate records going back a long ways. There are no records that we've been able to find for the Pine Point Cooperative Association. That doesn't mean it was invalid or didn't exist. But the, the records, again, sort of lead us to a bit of a dead end as far as telling us if I could pull or retrieve those records, who it was, how it was organized, what it was doing. I've been unable to do that because the records, again, are not available online uh, or through uh, our first level of search uh, modality. Um, the deed contains conditions. The deed in 1964 contains conditions on the grant. And those conditions are that the town of Scarborough retained a right to restrict the grantee from sales, mortgages, or encumbrances, sort of further conditions that could be placed on the property without the town's approval. Um, it also had a, a uh, condition that said in 1964, if that cooperative association ceased to exist as a corporation for one year, the land would revert to the town. <clears throat> I haven't seen records that showed it ever existed in the first place, nor that it ceased to exist, so that's tough to verify, but that condition was there. It also has uh, building restrictions to say that the, the buildings and improvements on the site may only be enlarged on the side facing the Scarborough River. Um, so after uh, the 1964 deed from the town to the Cooperative Association issued, there was a deed from the association <coughs> back to the town. This tends to suggest it existed at least in, in enough of a format to, to convey a real estate interest. Um, 
And that granted the town public easement rights to use the pier and the landing for parking, fishing, and loading and unloading of gear as a public landing. And it uses a phrase that I put in quotes, on terms equal to all. That phrase has no particular single definition in the law. It's not what we would call a term of art. Uh, the use of property on terms equal to all is, is not something I can describe to you as how that works, but this was a condition of the cooperative's grant of an easement to the town for those, uh, those uses. That easement was uh, designed to be sort of self-terminating. It has a, a self-actuating termination provision in it if the town fails to live up to these conditions. I could not tell because I haven't seen the writ whether that deed was a counterpart to the town's deed, whether it was a quid pro quo. It's interesting mm -hmm. that they're separated by some number of months. It was not simultaneous, strictly speaking. There was an interval of, uh, I believe, you know, four or five months between the town's deed to the cooperative and the cooperative's deed back to the town. I'm unable to explain whether there's any significance in that. and offer no suggestions or conclusions as to whether that matters, but I, I wanted that to be part of the record. Um, and th this tends to show that the two deeds written together or, or read together suggest that there was some uh, outcome here which was ordained by the writ of mandamus which led the town to give the deed um, over what presumably was, was some you know initial objections, thus the writ of mandamus, but to condition that deed to insert some sort of, of covenants on the owner that allow the town to retain some control. So it's not as though the town was forced to hand over the deed uh, without any, any sort of uh, reservations or powers. Whatever the writ was, it seems to have been fulfilled in such a way that the town could exert a continuing control over this piece of property. From 1964 uh, to 1976, there seems to be a period of of relative uh, calm in terms of the records. And in 1976, um, there was a, a, an association, the Pine Point Cooperative Association, was organized as a corporation. This uh, is, at least in name, the, the current owner of the property. The cooperative was organized under a particular statute which had been uh, uh, passed somewhat recently uh, or at the time in 1976, somewhat close in time to the organization of the, the corporation. And it's what's known as a fish marketing association. Uh, the corporate documents, the, the charter documents for that association are available through the Secretary of State's office. I do have them in the file. And it is, it is very strictly organized, almost you know, <coughs> chapter and verse, uh, call and response to the statutes um, which govern a fish marketing association. Its purpose is articulated. It's the purpose in the, the statute. Its membership is described. It's the membership description in the statute. It's the restrictions on transfers of interests are articulated in the corporate documents. Those restrictions on transfers of interest come from the statute. So the corporation was organized by somebody who knew the statute, recited the statute, and it is very much a statutory fish marketing association. The Fish Marketing Association is, is uh, as a statutory creature, uh, keeps company with other nonprofit organizations of a cooperative nature. And a, a cooperative, just for your general uh, understanding, is a, a, a sort of a membership corporation, if you can think of it in that term. Uh, it's designed to be, it's not supposed to have what's known as capital stock, those things to which uh, uh, dividends are allocable or uh, charges can be uh, made against stock. It, it has a, a par value and the, the corporation can be valued based on the, the number of shares outstanding and the value of those shares as a multiple. These are, are instead more along the lines of, if you look in the statutory scheme, some things you may be familiar with. Other, other similar corporations include cemetery corporations, fraternal organizations, um, religious societies or educational support societies, uh, organizations. These are things that don't, strictly speaking, have a core profit motive or capital flooding into them and out of them on behalf of corporate shareholders. They don't distribute proceeds against shares uh, at the end of the year necessarily. So 
Um, th that's the, the nature of a fish marketing association. And there's a portion of the statute which describes the way such an association is supposed to conduct itself as a nonprofit. Um, and I put that section in the memo to say, these associations are nonprofit in as much as they are not organized to make a profit for themselves or their members, but only for their members as producers of fishery products. So this is, is in the case of a fish marketing association, a statutory empowerment to allow fishermen, those engaged in the fisheries uh, uh, business, as the statute says, to act collectively, to, to join resources and make joint efforts at the marketing of fish in a way which is exempt from antitrust uh, mm -hmm. actions. And, and that's usually a very boring area of the law, and, and I don't want to go too much into it, nor do I spend a lot of time there in what I do. But if, if market actors get together to join forces and share resources and to some extent engage in activities which have an impact on prices collectively, that is a regulated form of economic activity. That is a, a form of concerted action which, if it gets to a big enough scale, does invoke antitrust concerns. If every single fisherman in the world were a member of one corporation, they could dictate prices. And this scales down on the lower end to some extent and was um, enough of a concern that the late Maine legislature said, no, we're okay with, with some level of this. We will allow fishermen to coalesce and act in concert within these fish marketing associations. They can take some steps to act together, which ordinarily might have triggered antitrust concerns. So, so that's what the, the holding company was to which uh, the title was transferred in 1977. And there was a deed um, with the transfer restrictions that are in the 1964 deed are just brought forward. Uh, it's subject to the town's 1964 easement rights, and we have a record that the town did consent to the transfer from the original uh, Pine Point Cooperative to the Pine Point Fishermen's Cooperative. So the town was consulted for this transfer. The town issued some form of consent. Another uh, 20 years uh, roll by, and in 1997, the records disclose a couple of things uh, in the Registry of Deeds and these echo actions that were taken at the town level. Um, the, uh, one of the restrictions to keep in mind is that there is a, what I call in, in I think this memo, a debt ceiling. That there is a restriction on the maximum amount of debt that the cooperative is allowed to incur against the property. Th there may be some reasons for that that you know, I could guess at, but I, I don't consider that part of you know, my review at this point. Uh, you know, we can talk about that or the town can supply those reasons. But in any event, if there is a mortgage or, or lien or, or other form of debt given as sort of collateral uh, support uh, against this property, the town is supposed to authorize the maximum amount of that debt. That number was set quite low initially. Inflation kind of didn't keep up with those numbers, and this happens a lot with documents and numbers over time. And in 1997, there was, there was a request to increase the debt ceiling uh, to $170,000. And I think at that time, as has been pointed out by uh, uh, counsel for uh, the, the, the Baileys or the Clouds, I want to make sure I get the name right, um, there was also a, a suggestion that that debt, if it is going to be structured, um, have a condition in it, that the town hold a, a right of first refusal, or it's called a, it articulates as, as a first right of refusal, which is not quite right, but that the, the town is supposed to have some sort of preferred position or priority with respect to that debt if there is a foreclosure or some sort of action to collect the debt. The mechanism by which that might work is not altogether clear. Mm. Um, and when you look at the debt that was pledged or, or, or against which this property was pledged, it contains no such feature. So, so th there was this condition inserted in 1997 that the debt is supposed to have some sort of ability for the town to have this, this right of first refusal to, to step in in the event of a foreclosure auction. But the collateral documents 
contain no provisions which provide that right. There's no independent agreement providing the right of first refusal to the town in any circumstance. And so I, I again, flag that as a bit of an inconsistency in terms of intent or design versus reality. And there are other instances of this that, that we'll get to in a second. Um, so the town was asked to uh, increase the debt ceiling and was given uh, an, a, a series of agreements um, or, or uh, an agreement to, um, to uh, I guess, agree to this debt ceiling in connection with a transfer of the stock of the uh, co-op itself. And this is recited to some degree that the transfer is, is in a whereas provision that the, the co-op ownership is being transferred. Um, and then there's an exhibit A to this 1997 agreement which is recorded increasing the debt ceiling. The exhibit A is some sort of ledger of a transaction. Uh, it, it, it mentions uh, credit given for payoffs of a mortgage at the time. It mentions payoffs, I believe, or, or repayments of some personal loans is my best interpretation of it. And there's a number in a column titled uh, sale of stock where some individuals were given what looks like uh, an amount of, of consideration for the sale of their stock to, I, I believe, you know, what's identified, we assume, as, as the buyer in the, uh, the document to which it's attached. Exhibit A, though it's attached to the document, is not referenced in the document. This, again, is, is one of these inconsistencies. It's, I, I, I have a tough time explaining what the Exhibit A, what its function is, what its purpose is. It's, it's dated the day after the thing it's attached to, and the thing it's attached to doesn't reference it. So again, this is, is something where when I am asked to look at this and try to explain what happened, that's another fact that I can't quite, I don't have context for that. That, that makes a lot of sense to me yet. I'm not sure if it's significant, but this is, again, sort of one of the things where the, the observances and formalities around these, these structures are, are somewhat difficult for me to, to come to conclusive um, advice positions on. Uh, there is um, a parking lease, which uh, the council chair has mentioned, um, which accompanies uh, or, or sort of supports I think 25 spaces at the restaurant operation on the premises. And I, I think that the spaces are necessary for the restaurant to hit its parking covenants. That's the, the working assumption that I have. Um, here's where I have an error in that memo where uh, my initial information was that that lease uh, was subject to a, you know, uh, what's a typical provision that consent will not be unreasonably withheld, conditioned, or delayed. That is, in fact, not present in the document. So the town's consent is not restricted in such a manner. I, I'm not giving the town advice to act unreasonably, but I'm simply pointing out that uh, that is an error in my memo and that there is no uh, reasonableness restriction on the town's consent. I flagged this for that I would make these remarks. I, I alerted council for the current owners and council for the buyers that I would state this at the meeting for the purpose of correcting the record, but I, I give no advice on what the town's consent position needs to be as to the lease. It's just correcting error in the memo. Um, and then some of the materials that were forwarded to me were, were submitted on behalf of the prospective uh, buyers, uh, summarizing what they view as the uh, you know, favorable conditions for transfer um, and that they are asking for um, an increase to the debt ceiling for $900,000. Um, there was an a additional correspondence that came in on the 31st of January, which suggested um, that the uh, uh, debt, if it were increased, would observe the requirement that this first right of refusal concept be inserted into the debt. Again, the specifics on that, the precise manner by which that would happen are not proposed. I believe that the attorney for the buyers has recognized that you know, that was, that was to comply with the documents, but she, she does not mean to dictate what those terms would be either. It's just to observe what the documents on the, on the table currently require. Um, and to propose a draft deed of transfer to her client, uh, which is 96 King LLC, which is a, a fairly 
uh, I'm going to say ordinary uh, form of entity. It's a, a main limited liability company. It is not a, a fish marketing uh, association, but it doesn't pretend to be. There, there is no, um, no uh, uh, Trojan horse or anything about the format of, of the buyer's entity. That is a perfectly normal entity for someone to hold property that they would own or and operate as a business, which the, the applicants or, or petitioners uh, make no, no bones about as to their, their intention. So uh, those are the materials uh, uh, to date. Um, and there again, there's some public record materials in terms of articles uh, that have been circulated. The articles include some, some uh, newspaper stories, I think from the 1980s, which give the impression, um, unsupported by any documents that I have, that there was a prior transfer <coughs> of the co-op stock that, that there were uh, owners uh, prior to the current owner, which is I think GT Management Corp Inc. Uh, owners known as uh, Chi and Kurtzman were their names. Mm. I've seen no records which suggest that took place. Uh, again, I, I don't dispute it. I just don't have documents in my possession which are consistent with that. There may be additional documents out there that I don't have, and, and this, our research and acquaintance with the circumstances of this is ongoing. Um, but there also, if that took place in the 1980s, there's not a town consent document that accompanies that. Uh, and so if there was a transfer of the ownership of the co-op interest in the 1980s, it doesn't seem that it left footprints, at least that I've found, which indicate the town was involved in that transfer. If that was a stock transfer, they may have taken the position that there was not a deed which needed consent. There was a, an assignment of corporate interests from one set of owners of those corporate interests to another. That's slightly inconsistent with how fish marketing associations would work. Um, but again, there, there's a lot of, of sort of flexibility in the way that, that this corporation seems to have been documented and run not to anyone's particular detriment or, or in a way which, which you know, uh, I, I have a, a pejorative understanding of. It's just, it's, it's hard for me to sort of diagnose all of the steps that have led us to here, but I can tell you that it is, it is not a straight line from 2019 back to 1964. That's, that's my, my one sort of conclusive takeaway is that there are things that were said and set up in 1964 and 1976 and 1997 and, and maybe in the 1980s, somewhere in between, that are not, they don't have antecedents in 1964. And, and what I'm seeing in, in 2019 does not map one to one all the way back consistently with a set of steps that have been fully documented to, to show compliance with all expectations nor do all those expectations have a reasonable degree of, of, of uh, compliance entitlement. That, for example, the financing contingency that says the debt has to have this right of first refusal. Not sure quite how that would have worked. Um, you know, and, and it was not observed, right, that, that life has gone on without that right of first refusal. There has been uh, financing against this property that has been uh, you know, cashed out or refinanced several times along the way, and nobody has worried uh, in the banking side or the owner side, and seemingly nobody's, the, the town has not gotten involved with any right of, of first refusal in these finance packages. So th there is an, an interesting history to this property that some of which remains mysterious. It's not fully explainable in a, in a linear there was not a, a lawyer sitting on someone's lap for all, you know, 55 years of this thing's existence to, to make sure that it stayed within the narrow confines of, of how everything should be done with I's dotted and T's crossed. But that's not unusual in the history of operating properties uh, in Scarborough, mm -hmm. Maine. Uh, if I were to, to go and audit the, the business and real estate documentation of any corporation in town. You know, it's routine for me to find things like this when I'm asked to participate in transactions as a transactional attorney. You find things that may have been observed or may not have been observed, and the significance of those varies 
depending on the context of the deal. So this is not some sort of, of indictable, you know, on fire kind of, of uh, problem. It's just one of those things that looks like a, a small, close group of people operating a corporation for purposes who may not have had reasons to observe strict formalities in every step they took over 55 years. Um, so so that's, that's the flavor of my review. And you know, I, I would love to tell you that there's an, an easy sort of you know, flow chart of, of what the town's consent or approval should take account of, but I don't have all those answers yet. I don't have the writ of mandamus. Uh, and, and I can't tell you, you know, what the consent process looked like in 1976 uh, and, and exactly what it was in 1997. I don't have those records. So I cannot give you a, a prescription that says the town council of Scarborough <coughs> must account for the following one, two, three, four, five, six factors before consenting to a transfer. Uh, we've heard a lot of, of very valuable information on the bona fides of the parties and those I have no reason to, to doubt that, that everybody's acting in, in good faith and, and seems like you have a lovely town full of lovely people uh, <laughs> running great businesses. Um, and and this is, there's nothing here which, which leads me to, to believe that any of that is, is in doubt or in jeopardy. Um, but when asked to sort of summarize the, the legal state of affairs, it's a little murky. Uh, in terms of what the town is is being asked to do, one thing that I I did want to flag is, you know, some of these issues and some of the stakeholder concerns that have been voiced. Um, you know, uh, I think there has been some question um, that has come through Tom to me in terms of could some of this be cleaned up? You know, if the town identifies a clean thread of issues that it is concerned about, or or outcomes that it wishes to perpetuate, could we? sort of clear the decks of this a little bit and, and maybe accomplish the town's goals if it articulates its goals, and that's not my job. That's obviously within your discretion. But could we, for example, um, tie those to the assignment of the parking lease? <coughs> Seemingly, yes. That's a fairly clean vehicle. Uh, the town's parking lease is not encumbered by any of this. The town's parking lease is a standalone document. It does not have any uh, writ of mandamus around it, uh, that wouldn't have been possible. It's, it dates, you know, post-dates the writ by, by a number of years. Uh, the town's ability to condition its consent to the parking lease is, as noted, un, unfettered. Um, and so there may be some opportunity here if the town does wish to, if the town, you know, council wishes to, to uh, articulate a set of standards and respond to concerns of stakeholders and, and public interests, we could very likely tie those concerns to the consent of the parking lease if it's within the town's judgment that that's something that needs to be done. Um, and then that would sort of leave many of these other issues for resolution between the transacting parties without the town having a heavy need to get involved or untie knots that it hasn't necessarily been invited to, to tie or untie. So that's my, my summary and I'm happy to, to try and supplement that uh, with responses to questions to the extent helpful. Is this yeah, the appropriate yeah. time for yeah. this? Yeah, so um, thank, thanks, Peter, for that. I, and don't mean to get off track here, but I did want to take this moment to, uh, to update on a disclosure matter. Uh, when we met last on the topic of the Pine Point Fishermen's mm -hmm. Co-op at our January 16th town council meeting, I disclosed mm -hmm. my relationship to several uh, members of the Pine Point community, including shellfish harvesters and other individuals who are engaged in, in this matter. Uh, I would like to do this again. Uh, my son, William Hamill, who's here with the hat in the audience, uh, is on the shellfish committee uh, and served as a spokesperson. I have other relatives. You, you heard from, uh, from Mo earlier, the, a number of the other Ericsons participated in, uh, in this session the last time. I'm also <coughs> related to at least two Tuies who are also clamors and hold commercial licenses to harvest shellfish in Scarborough. So, I'll stop there because time may not permit uh, my listing of other relatives who hold <laughs> recreational licenses, <laughs> student licenses who then became commercial diggers or have worked in the seafood-related uh, businesses in Pine Point, including Bailey's, Ken's, and Salty Bay. So um, we're well-placed in this business. Uh, main statutes, however, require that, uh, and our own town charter require 
municipal officials, including counselors, to address any conflicts of interest, actual or perceived. Uh, this extends to av avoiding the appearance of a conflict of one by disclosure. So, you know, I want to begin by saying, and these are called pecuniary interests or otherwise known as financial interests. I do not have any financial interests at all in this matter, neither direct nor indirect business interests, nor any personal financial interests whatsoever, past, present, or contemplated uh, on the matter of any perceived conflicts. Though my relatives and I may share a tendency to be outspoken on issues that are important to us, uh, we are, each and every one of us, very independent-minded by nature uh, and not afraid to speak up or be heard. And that's not unlike many Mainers, perhaps especially Pine Pointers. So we form our own opinions, we make up our own minds, my comments and positions are my own, just as those of my relatives and the members of the Pine Point community are their own. As a public official, I took an oath to act to the best of my ability in the best interests of the entire town of Scarborough, not solely my own or those of my family or neighborhood or special interests. So I'm, I'm capable, capable, confident, and committed to study this issue and others like it fairly and objectively and to participate in the process to make decisions that are informed, objective, and unbiased for the benefit of the whole community. And I, I will submit this uh, for inclusion in the record. Thank you. And, and at this point, I'm a little uncertain. Does anybody have any council members have any questions or concerns with what was just shared? Councilor Katarina? Yeah. Uh, I don't have concerns. I thank you for that because, uh, as you know, I'm one to disclose when I've got some uh, potential conflicts. Um, and I appreciate you, you know, laying that all out. And I agree that, you know, if there were no direct pecuniary, you know, interest or whatever, I don't have an issue with Councillor Hamill continuing with this. So. Okay. Anybody else? Any? Councillor Foley? Uh, I would just also say thank you to Councillor mm -hmm. Hamill for, you know, laying that out there. I think it is important. I think perception does become reality oftentimes. And so, meeting it head on and throwing it on the table is important. I have no concerns that there's uh, any real conflict. And if we had to recuse ourselves every time we had a familial connection, I would only have one person in town that I'm related to. So I wouldn't have a lot of problems. But as I've learned about, you know, and gotten to know this town much better over the last 20, 25 years, um, everybody's related to everybody. There's a lot of uh, that there. So that, that doesn't concern me either. So. That didn't sound quite right. <laughs> quite what I meant, but I didn't mean it. I meant it in a positive way. Anyway, so you, you get my point. Thanks. Councilor Bateman. <laughs> thank you. Um, so first, uh, Councilor Hamill, thank you very much. I think it's uh, um, very gentlemanly of you to provide that notice, although it, I don't necessarily believe it was necessary, but I just want to be sure that um, everyone understands that we should use this level of judgment um, in all instances, just as we did when Councilor Donovan was accused of having special interest in a previous item, a previous issue, and we, it was obviously clear that he did not. So I do appreciate that, but, and um, I think as long as we use that across the board for all persons. Anything else? Anybody? Councilor Donovan? Yeah, obviously there is no pecuniary interest here, uh, but the uh, public perception of a conflict created by having multiple family members be the principal spokesman against this certainly would raise it in the minds of the interested parties here, buyer and seller. So uh, I think it's a different standard than the pecuniary. It's the public's perception. Uh, and that's that would be my concern. So I guess all those in favor of Don continuing, at least in the, in the workshop uh, conversation tonight? Everybody in favor? Oh, yeah. I don't think we have to vote. I don't think you need to vote. No, no, vote. Okay. If no one disagrees, then you don't, there's no vote needed. Okay, great. So does anybody at this point turn you that? Does anybody have any questions for, for Peter? <clears throat> Council Bula? I do. So first, thank you very much. Um, so uh, um, waiting to, to hear from you. Um, been around for a long time on this council, and so I, I've got a few connections. And I did try to attempt to reach out to the uh, to the former. Um, he was the first selectman on the board 
1975 when we became a city council and he became the city council chairman, who was around, his name's Gary Lafano. I wasn't able to connect, but I did find a couple of others. So this is a great history lesson around that. Um, I think that, uh, as one person said earlier, there's also a lot of folklore uh, and to what went on, and it's about old families and dads and granddads um, and what happened. The question I have, though, sorry, is um, if that writ of, I think it was called Menandis? Mandamus. Mandamus yes. comes back and says whatever it might be that something did not um, get done. Do the subsequent approvals, including the <clears throat> increase in the uh, mortgage debt limit, negate any uh, requirements um, in that Mandamus? It, it's unlikely. I mean, th this is where I'd say I need to see the document to figure yeah. out what it actually says. These things are quite rare. Yeah. I mean, it's like the you know Marbury versus Madison case was about one of those. It's like yeah. the, the, the they're they're simply you don't see a lot of them. I've never seen one in real life. Like since you know I've been doing this 19 years. Like I've I've never seen <laughs> one. So so uh, I do need to take a look at it before I tell you. It's you know it sounds. Fantastic. Writ of mandamus. Ah, it's Latin, right? So, so what it says, I, I don't know. But my guess is, and the reason why I think it's unlikely to have a lasting effect, is that it was such a writ, such a, the trouble of getting, going to, to get one of those is because a, a town or, or a government actor refuses to do something. So, so there was maybe there was a deal, or somebody said they had a contract, and the town promised to sign or, you know, deed the property, whatever it was, and the town refused to do it. And the only way to get it, shake it loose from the town, was to sue for this writ. The, the story's <coughs> got to be interesting, frankly. But um, if if the writ had not been observed, whoever went to the trouble to get it would have, I assume, raised hell. <coughs> That, that something in the writ was unfulfilled. Um, and and you, you presumably would have seen more about that in the ensuing documents, that you know this condition not having been fulfilled, here's an update on the writ, or here's part two, as the writ you know, chapter six requires. And you don't see that. So my, my best guess, and I, it's, you know, I have a pretty high degree of confidence, less than 100%, but it's above 90 it is that the writ was fulfilled by the two deeds in 1964. That's, that's my guess. And, you know, that there have been some changes since then. You know, I, I don't think the writ says, and it shall forever be thus, or we would have seen somebody arguing that too. You know, that that, that is, is the kind of thing that should show up. You know, my, my sense is that if, if everybody has been living this wrong since the first alteration, in 1976, you know, that that probably, you know, that's, that's only 12 years after the writ issue. People would have been around at the time yeah. who would have been on top of that. Um, and if, if uh, the writ, you know, bars any, any uh, retooling of the arrangements, th that just seems unlikely. But I, I can't answer your question definitively until yep. I see it. Can I follow up? Sure. So um, uh, one follow-up question and a quick comment. Um, <laughs> Given the information that we have today and understanding that you're dealing with a state agency, which, by the way, I might have a contact to be able to see if the archives can expedite that. Um, I welcome that. Um, could the community of the council move forward in its consideration without a copy of that writ? I, I think that, you know, for this purpose and this format of discussion, yes. Uh, and that's where I say I'm, I'm going to put it into the 90 percent, you know, confidence interval. I'd like to get it, and, and the process of, obtain, of obtaining it is finite. It's there. It's in the building. Uh, we just have to yeah. get the right slips of paper to, to, to do it. It's not as though that's a forever, uh, you know, sort of process. It's just taken more than three weeks at this point for them yeah. to get it. So, so I think that there's no reason for the, the council to, to, to uh, you know, postpone this conversation, particularly where, where all these, you know, the stakeholders are, are very actively engaged and the, you know, the issue is is ripe. I don't think that there's enough here to defer the conversation. I okay. think that you can probably proceed with confidence that this is, you know, this is solvable. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for me? Go ahead. Council. The, given that the, all the rights that the town has through easements uh, and uh, right of, uh, right of uh, approval, uh, that they all proceed 
the recording of this potentially nine hundred thousand uh, dollar mortgage. So none of those are really impaired by the mortgage. They'll still exist even in a foreclosure. That's correct. That the, the towns, the covenants in the deed are not. They cannot be extinguished by a subsequent uh, mortgage. Mm. The 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 town's easement rights are have priority to the mortgage. <clears throat> Unless the town agrees to subordinate to the mortgage, which I would not recommend, right. the town's rights would survive, at, such as they are. The town's easement. Uh, and, and whatever rights it has for parking and public usage and the 2010 easements, which were to facilitate a crane construction or something, as I understand it, all of those documents would survive. Those rights are pre-existing to any debt which would come as a result of this $900,000 mortgage. So you have a, a risk of a foreclosure in any mortgage, the indebtedness, uh, uh, and so we're being... Uh, it's being proposed that some sort of right of first refusal be granted, but all that really does is puts us in position to owe the balance on the debt because the debt doesn't go away. That that's that's functionally correct. That that I mean, I, I have a tough time pouring a complete meaning into the right of first refusal concept. It's not. It it's something that that you know has more sort of. Uh, you know, conversational currency than legal formality, and and let, if I were to to prescribe a concept where such a right were created, if you wanted to say give the town a right of first refusal to purchase the property for the amount of the then outstanding debt at the time of any foreclosure, mm. right? You you could create such a framework. Uh, banks wouldn't like it. Right, and that's where I don't know if we want to create an impediment to financing for anybody, um, but that would take some doing because what happens in a foreclosure is the bank generally with an asset of this type is going to conduct an auction. They're, they're going to sell the property to the highest bidder. Auction sales are sort of fire sales to begin with. You're not getting market prices by and large at an auction. They advertise them hard and try to get activity that way, but it's not the same price you would get from a protracted discretionary, I don't like your offer and I can negotiate with you in arm's length market sale. And the presence of a right of first refusal in the town is the kind of thing that tends to depress prices further because bidders would say, well, you know, I, I go to the trouble and I, I show up to this auction and the town jumps into my shoes and, and buys at whatever price I, I you know, sagely bid. Uh, that, that why bother? Why bother showing up to the auction that day? And, and it's, it's a marginal decrease. It's a theoretical one. I don't know what the number would be, the, the sort of the quotient on that in the market impact. But it, it, it is certainly depressive of prices to have a right of first refusal present. Not as much as it is in some other, you know, there are things which depress market prices further, but that tends to chill a bidding atmosphere. So in a classic foreclosure circumstance, the bank ends up owning <coughs> uh, uh, the property but would still have the obligation uh, upon its subsequent sale to receive to get the town's approval. Yes, I think that that because of the the format of the town's covenants are in the deed, the estate which is foreclosed would be subject to those covenants. So those are baked into the the nature of the asset which is being foreclosed okay. and and sold. Thank you. Council Hill, did you have a question? Yeah, I uh, we had originally requested a quote unquote full title search, you know, in the deeds, restrictions, covenants, and, and any other rights or encumbrances pertaining to the, to the co-op. Um, so can you help me understand um, how your work would, you know, does it fulfill that request? Sure. So, so, so we have done what's known as a current owner search. We've updated the title to look for anything that would have affected the title to this property since 1964. Uh, a full title search sort of going behind that is asking a lot. We're always careful with those because uh, the, t the property was owned by the town of Scarborough. And so when you run title to property, you, you can't run a piece of property. You have to run the owner. Mm -hmm. And if we're running title to, to things owned by the town of Scarborough, it's tons. You just have to look at, you know, endless amounts of things. Every time the town files a, a tax lien, there's an entry in the registry that somebody has to look at and say, no, it's just a tax lien. And so to do a full title, we, we interpreted it like you, you don't really want us to do that. Um, so, so what we tried to do was, you know, and we have, 
what's known as scheduling. You know, we have records of the town over a long time because we've represented the town forever, but we don't have it going back to, you know, Christopher Columbus. Uh, and so we, we did not do a full title um, as, as that term is ordinarily called, but we did look at what we have available to us to ascertain that these are the records which are visible uh, that pertain to this property from 1964 forward. Well, it's disappointing to learn that we need title insurance even though we're not getting a full title search. <laughs> but at any rate, I had a follow-up question for you that it did touch on one thing that you had mentioned about, uh, um, I know I've read all of this, I've read your work, I, I, and a lot of it, frankly, uh, we read in other documents that were provided by, by Sue and Vincent on the sure. work that they did. You know, uh, so I'm still struggling with how do we verify the ownership? Uh, you know, is this? You've done a great job of summarizing how it's you know that it's gone through the years, but what what is the current what is the current ownership? What are our current rights? It does seem to me that that's still not completed or conclusive. How, how do we possibly move forward on a pending transaction without knowing those things? I, I mean, that's there's a, a slight sort of value judgment there with the you know the last part of your question. I don't I don't want to substitute my judgment for that of the council in terms of how you go forward or the rhetorical nature of, of your last question. But but I'll I'll try and and I'll note that you know we have some representations from the the current owners as to what the status of that ownership is. Uh, there are some corporate records available that, that we can use to confirm, but the ownership of corporations is typically an off record. Those are private records. Uh, corporations file annual reports which list their officers or, or some, you know, sometimes their, their members, depending on how they're set up. But, but there's not, in, in the ordinary course of business, it's, it's not unusual to not know who owns every share of stock of a corporation, right? That's, that's private. Um, uh, in this case, we have some records which indicate the initial owners. We have some filings that indicate transfers at the time. We have snapshots. Um, but, I, you know, I have no reason to dispute the information which has come to the town as far as the representations of the current ownership. That's, that's as reliable as anything else uh, okay. that I would see in a transactional circumstance. Okay, fair. And I just want one final thing, if I may, just, it, and it does tie directly to what you just said. One thing that really just keeps rolling around in, in my mind is this matter of status, you know, of this property as, uh, you know, working waterfront, what sort of status it has or not, or what sort of status a fisherman's co-op has or does not have as it relates to the working waterfront. And I've seen the maps and the easements are interesting to see. You see easements all the way around, but this property doesn't have that. Do you have an opinion on that, or can I can, you make a I representation? Can, yeah, I can. I can at least I can explain what what the records show and and how to interpret them. That there is this property is still subject to zoning, right? And mm -hmm. its current use is consistent with its zoning, as far as we understand it. Uh, that the town controls that zoning, but as you know, there's no guarantee that the zoning will remain the same for you know weeks, months, or centuries. Uh, zoning can change over time. Um, and, and so, you know, this is a working waterfront zoned parcel. Uh, but, you know, one of the, there's nothing in the, the documents, even though the town has this consent right, there's no expression that it says it must forever be this way, right? It, it entrusts the review of the circumstances to the town, but the deed does not say this property shall forever be used and owned in a certain format. Mm. That would have been a fairly easy restriction to, to craft and it's not there. Um, so so there, there is, a, again, an articulation of a review process, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the founding fathers, so to speak here, um, decided not to, to put a perpetual use restriction on this property. It is not subject to any particular use restriction, nor is it subject in the documents that have the town's name on them to any condition that it be forever owned by an entity in such and such format. That is, that is an echo of history and not law. Uh, and so, so I don't see anything here which says it must forever remain this way. And, and again, there's nothing that says, you know, thou shalt not do this with your corporation. That, that's not in the town's oversight. And the, the, uh, there's nothing which requires it to, 
you know, in the documents to, to stay this way. But the town has made decisions as to how this portion of Pine Point will be zoned. That's how the town generally expresses its opinion as to, to land usages as a, as a group or, or properties that fall within them. But there's not an expression of, of sort of unique use restrictions on this property that's in these documents. Just to further clarify that point, uh, apart from this building, the property and, uh, and building that we're talking about, the town has chosen to impose on itself through a series of covenants um, heavily restricting basically all the land around it. Right. And that is, uh, the, this term of uh, working waterfront is a defined term uh, in that covenant document. I, I don't know how long that that term and its definition has been around, um, but it's worth noting that um, there does seem to be general agreement around this notion of working waterfront, and maybe that's a productive part of conversation or consideration for the council right. members is to define what does that mean to us. Uh, there's probably a legal definition, but we may be, be able to define something that makes sense for us given these unique circumstances and uh, the situation we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. And with that, then there be maybe ways to assure and give ourselves comfort going forward. Mm -hmm. Councilor Caterina, do you have well, a question? Uh, well, my question had to do with, and I believe you answered it, was did you see anything in the in the title searching that would indicate that it had to be held in a certain type of ownership? And, and you've been pretty clear. Right, that o only the pattern, right? The, right, the, pattern, the pattern is that right. it has been, right. but there's nothing that, that says thou shalt, thou shalt that it, it will, it will okay. be forever, so. I, I just have a, a quick question. I know that you, we had had an earlier conversation, Councillor Foley, town manager and myself and it, it sounded like through that history though there was always a thread of definition of what the co-op would actually be and there was real language in there was to exist or really create a marketplace for the fisheries and, it, and it, it certainly was in some of the documents that you were able to trace through the years certainly it's operated that way up until today is that you know so is, is does that give some credence that that really was an intended use all along and should be a consideration as we look to the future if yeah. that's what this, this body wants to do? But it, clearly, would you agree there was an intent all the way through the documentation that that was what I, What I can certainly, what I think confirms your, your, your point is that when asked to, to demonstrate to the town, at, the, at a time when the town did have a consent opportunity, there was a very conspicuous demonstration of the nature of the transferee, the, the, the recipient of the rights. There was a, a very, you know, full display. This is what we are. It's going, you know, the writ of mandamus issued requiring you to give it to this owner, and now it's going to this owner. And, and the town, when it did its review, was presented with something which was a very rigid image of a, a fish marketing association. And so, you may surmise that, that that information was material to the town's consideration of that transfer. Um, and, and whether those concerns are still current, whether they, they have some sort of anchor in the writ of mandamus that that, that says, you know, this better be owned by a, a co-op, that I don't know. But, but what you can see is that along the way, there have been efforts made to keep this thing in. It was initially a cooperative and it's still in a cooperative. And, and that cooperative was designed around the kind of uses that are consistent with a working waterfront fish marketing association. And the use of the property since that time has exhibited, generally speaking, those, those uses. Uh, and so it, it's hard to ignore that as, as having been material to the town's deliberation process over the years. Um, if they were looking at something, that's a good candidate for what they were looking at. Hmm. Any other questions? I think it's like Katie. Yep. Yeah. So um, this feels kind of like trying to peel an onion. <laughs> it's uh, multi-layered. And thank you for the history lesson, because if you'd been my social studies teacher, I probably would have paid better attention. <laughs> um, <laughs> I. Uh, so what, the one thing that's been troubling me, or I'm still trying to wrap my head around, because it's been suggested that uh, this this sale, this transaction, conveyance of property, could happen with or without the town's consent. Do you have a strong opinion or feeling on, on both those ways? Because I'm most interested in, in not even forget the names on the, 
the transactions I'm most interested in untangling this web so that whomever <coughs> is going to do this going forward, how, in whatever form that takes, that we solve it all for once and for all. Like that's my sure. number one goal. Sure. So 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 thank you for your your preface. Um, <laughs> I hope you had a good social studies teacher anyway. But you wound up as a town counselor, so social studies clearly figured you know, very prominently in your life. Um, so, so I think that, that when you look at, uh, there was, some, there was a, a quick suggestion in one of the letters um, to the town from, from the prospective buyer's council that perhaps if, if there were a corporate transfer, that the town's review of a deed would not be invoked because if, if you take the shares of the thing and transfer the shares and thus, you know, move the ownership of the asset that way by moving the ownership of the thing that owns it, uh, that, that there's not a deed generated by that. If you buy all the shares of stock of my corporation, I don't give you a deed. I just, you know, give you the stock. And so that there was some question as to, to, to whether the town's consent would be implicated in that format of transaction, but I think there are two answers which probably moot the necessity of that inquiry. One, uh, there's still a, a request to increase the debt ceiling substantially from its current level, that, that the pending transaction is such that if they need $900,000 worth of financing, regardless of the, the format of transfer, there's a need for the town consent to that. So, so that brings this particular buyer to you, at least for that element, which still has a consent process associated with it. The second thing is, you know, a, a transfer of the corporate interests is a little wonky, um, you know, for, for a couple a reasons. Term. Yeah, that's a legal term. <laughs> um, and and those, are, those reasons do not necessarily invoke the town of Scarborough's interests. Uh, you know, it's, those are things which, which generally you know, buyers are a little shy about buying corporations when they can buy assets because when you buy the assets, you get the assets. When you buy the stock, you get the liabilities right. and the assets. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so so those you know corporate transfers are generally less common than asset transfers for a deal of this type anyway. Um, and as I understand it, you know that's the 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 buyer's attorney and I have have discussed generally. I don't think that that there's any suggestion that they're they're seeking to end run the town's consent they're here before you with you know plenty of, of people being very very above board so I don't think that's I don't think that's an element that that the town is going to wake up tomorrow morning and find that the assets have moved without a consent that just seems you know there are a lot of reasons why that wouldn't work or if it did the they, they couldn't finance it in the means that they're currently proposing to do they need to come to you for the nine hundred thousand dollar number anyway Thank you. I hope that's an answer. No, that helps okay. a little bit. <laughs> Councilor Beban, you I'm all set. Thank you. Set. Yeah. Um, so seeing no more questions, I believe. Thank you very much. It was You're very informative. You're very welcome. Um, so I think at this point, um, the, the, the goal would be to, much like we did with Piper Shores, just go down and, and just, to, you know, for this to move forward, what would be the thing, see if we can develop some consensus around the types of conversations we'd like to have between the two parties. So I don't know who wants to volunteer to... Would, would it be helpful if I read back? I think Mr. Turner, who spoke to us right. earlier, uh, laid out a series of things, and I, he's here in our, uh, still in the audience, so he'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I might suggest that might be a way to start. And sure. there's a couple of things I was taking notes uh, I think there's other ways to satisfy some of those con some of those concerns. So the first one I, I took down was uh, on-site buying year-round. Second one was uh, requiring 75 barrel bait storage, bait storage on Capacity. site. Yeah. Next one was uh, ensuring that restaurant activities do not interfere with the comings and goings kind of around the facility. I would just <coughs> say it. It strikes me that the easements we hold and the rights that <coughs> flow with that give us uh, some protections in that regard already. I think specifically too is around commercial launches. So really thinking about mm -hmm. people arriving by, mm -hmm. you know, taxis, boat taxis, or those types of things. The next one was guaranteed access to the so-called dirt lot, uh, and I guess part of that was 
uh, potentially for other bait dealers and or buyers potentially if, um, to the extent that fishermen want to do business with others or had to. Uh, again, that area is covered entirely by uh, working water for the covenant the town <coughs> has to abide by. And the last one that I took note of was a right of first refusal to the fishermen um, at the time of next transfer. I had one other. No commercial access um, limited by the restaurant use. Is that what? Oh, did you already say I that think one? Peter oh, clarified me on that one. So I'm not saying that's exclusive, but at least that's a starting point from the user's point of view. So starting there, does does anybody have any comments about those? Those seem reasonable, unreasonable. Councilor Bay, I saw your sure. Um, so I don't want, I guess, my comment to be uh, one of the things I've been learning very quickly up at the State House being on the, um, the what used to be called the LCRED, which is Economic Development, <laughs> is about um, um, everyone from local municipalities up to the state level interfering with um, uh, commerce uh, from, a, from a standpoint of dictating what can and can't happen or what should and shouldn't happen, um, both from, a, um, from the company's perspective as well as even from the producer's perspective. Um, I have issues with several of the items that are on that list because one of the things that I heard in the very first workshop from our local fishermen was, and, and I'm generalizing the statement, that is um, we expect the buyer to buy our clams and our lobsters when it's convenient for them or when it's most advantageous for them. But they, there is no requirement for the sellers to automatically sell to, um, sell to the, um, the, new, the new owner of the co-op or the new owner of that business. So any restrictions, either for the seller of the pro product or even for the buyer of the product, um, I think is an interference and outside the scope of this council. And I think that putting in certain protective rights around commerce um, is unfair, um, only because there have been other industries in this community that we haven't taken into consideration. So as an example for the Downs, no consideration was given for us for supporting the harness racing industry. But yet it is obviously a very challenging industry that's, to some people, it's going away. So why do we give preference to one but not another? So I think that there is a community balance question in that when you're thinking about commerce and trade and how you support them. I'm not suggesting that we should get rid of any of our fishermen. I have supported them since the day I started here. In fact, I was one of the leads that built that pier or at least got the money to build that pier um, that's down there, the commercial pier. Um, and asking for waterfront money from the state that was about two and a half million dollars. So I don't want it to come across that I'm trying to, I, I just don't think that we should get into those things of guaranteeing in someone's business something for free when you aren't entitled to it in today's commerce market. Um, so re requiring who sells, who buys, what price, um, it, you know, the fact is that you, you go to whoever the highest price is you know, on a, on a seller's perspective, and you buy on the cheapest. It's no different than stocks. So I've, I'm a little concerned. I think there's a couple of items in there, though, that um, absolutely, I, I think that if anything, the interference or making sure commercialization, that there's no interference with commercial lobstering. And absolutely, I think that there's um, always been a concern about um, growth in this community, no matter even if it's down there, and about increased traffic getting in the way, making sure that that parking lot remains available for lobstermen, um, you know, the side parking lot absolutely agree with that, um, if not completely restrict it so that it's only commercial fishermen and lobstermen, I think, would be a preference. Um, and and I, I think that everything else comes in, in line with kind of what's already been suggested. I did have one question, and I don't have to answer it. When did the restaurant actually get started up? Because that, I can't imagine, was something that was there in 1964 when that first became the co-op. Well, I think it was back in the early uh, 40s. It was uh, from That restaurant's years. always been there? From my review, yeah, there's a the, there's always a the written record in, in their media accounts, but the restaurant has always been an integral part of that operation. I am shocked. So I was just curious because that's the one piece I didn't see in the timeline as far as um, when that kind of started. So I'm in agreement. I, I just don't think personally, and if the consent of the council is to include them, then I'll respect that. But I just don't believe that we should be setting standards on how, you know, a company either buys or sells product and how people who produce it have to sell or buy it either. So I, uh, the missing writ of mandamus, so we got a missing document. 
someplace in a building. Uh, I think we should find the document. You know, uh, that should be part of our due diligence. Uh, you heard uh, Peter's uh, representation in terms of, uh, you know, his search versus a title search. <coughs> I, I think we should wait for, for, for to find that document uh, and to confirm that it doesn't have, you know, other obligations or commitments that, uh, you know, we might need to uh, follow. Um, uh, the other thing I'd say is that I just, uh, this, you know, there are no guarantees in life. There's no guarantee that, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, how long will commercial fishing last in the Gulf of Maine? You know, the, uh, because of environmental factors and a lot of other things, tariffs and so forth, there's just no way of knowing, you know, what's going to happen with that in industry. And there's, there's a limit to what the town can do to try to ensure that. I mean, I'm building on what Sean said. Um, however, uh, uh, I think we should go if there's no way we can confirm, you know, that that will remain, you know, part of a working waterfront, uh, then we need to do the very next best thing to approximate that. So, and I think we've heard, uh, you know, people have referenced uh, Travis's, uh, I counted eight things that he, that he mentioned. I think we captured, uh, you know, some of them. Uh, I think we want to put a lot of energy and effort into going through that process. To confirm, you know, uh, if we can't confirm that an ownership and an assurance that commercial fisheries will continue there, that we do the the damn well next best thing. So I I just think we um, we put a lot of energy into other aspects of our economy. There's a lot of development going on in town, and I I would uh, suggest that uh, you know this uh, this part of uh, our business, our heritage. Uh, which we acknowledge in our comprehensive plan is important to us, um, that we should devote appropriate time and energy to that. Um, I, I'm okay with not seeing the writ of mandamus, mandamus, I should say, being a Latin teacher, um, based on what our attorney has told us. So, um, that being said, my guess, and this is just Jean Marie's theory on what went on over the years, it was an attempt by the town and the fishermen down at Pine Point to maintain working waterfront before it was officially <coughs> legalized, where you got this working waterfront, I believe that was in the early 1990s, if I'm recalling correctly, the working waterfront yeah. uh, statutes with the state were finally formalized and the municipalities and whatever didn't have to do their own thing, uh, so to speak. But that being said, uh, as I mentioned before, I'm very, very, very strongly support maintaining that. That, And we have. I mean, and, and as been mentioned, we have all sorts of easements, and I want to see all of that um, continue, um, the access, right of access and whatever. I firmly believe that, you know, year-round buying would be important for me to see there. Uh, for the fishermen and women, um, and also uh, the bait storage. That would be huge. Now, I will tell you, I'm going to be very honest with you, that I was a little surprised to find out that if I didn't do business with the owners, I could still keep my bait there for free. I, that I'm, I've never seen before. I mean, I can see charging for storage if you're not doing business or whatever they want to work out. I don't care. But I think the availability of bait storage year-round uh, it would be important um, there. So th those are two things that I would really want to see. So. Yeah, so I think, essentially I'm going to echo exactly what Jean Marie said. I think the, um, you know, there's a difference between who can buy and who can sell, but also maintaining access. So I think we could argue that access to the bait cooler is just as important if not more important than keeping the dirt parking lot, the part of the dirt parking lot open. Um, so I think a common theme I'm hearing is access. So not necessarily getting our fingers into the day-to-day -day operation of it, but let's make sure that the access to uh, all involved is still there and is not reduced in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I think there's a reality that there'll be a new sheriff in town once the transfer ownership happens and that there's going to be some friction there in, a, in an adjustment period, and I think that's okay. Um, 
So I, you know, the deed doesn't have any restrictions. There's no use restrictions on the deed. So in theory, um, the the Baileys can can take that and shut it all down, and still be still be in compliance with the deed. So I I would say that I I think our be best mechanism is to work with the parking lease and how can we tie access, uh, you, not meddling in affairs, so to speak, but access. Uh, Tie the access to the parking lot, please. So. Um, I, I want to just say, officially go on record and say that I love the bait shed and I love the garage restaurant. Um, both great additions to Pine Point and, um, you know, clear, good examples of, and I too have worked in the restaurant industry uh, many, many years throughout my life, so um, I can appreciate good service and, and all of that when I see it. Um, so for me, this is, there's no, personal vendetta here. It's just, again, wanting to untangle the web and protect all people, protect the town's interest, protect the fishermen's interest, protect the, you know, uh, business owner's interest as well, because I don't want somewhere down the line this to come up again. So I want to make sure that we get what we need accomplished. I, I thought the list was mostly reasonable. Um, I do agree with Councillor Baybine's um, assertion that Interfering in that free commerce piece can get, can become a real sticky wicket. So I'm, I'm not really sure how that's our, our job or our role. Um, but it, it I understand and I hear the concerns um, that have been raised. So again, my, my number one goal is just let's untangle the web once and for all. Um, and you know, the Baileys have certainly proven themselves to be good business partners. Um, <coughs> we don't know that the next person in line would or would not. Um, but there would, what I can be assured of, or that I think we can be assured of, is there will be someone next in line. So this is gonna change, some kind of change, something's gonna happen sooner or later. It can't continue on as it has uh, either. So protecting those interests to the best of our ability, and perhaps following up with uh, Councilor Johnson's ideas, around using the parking lease as that mechanism would be where I'm kind of at right now. Councilor Donnie? Yeah, I agree with a lot of what's been said at the other end of the table. Uh, uh, I had not really thought about the regulatory part, but I, I am uh, cautioned by, by that, those observations. Uh, <coughs> uh, obviously, the working waterfront concept is at the heart of all of this. Uh, I would like to be able to think that uh, we're not going to press upon these negotiations conditions that are really going to interfere with what now has become a uh, over a million dollar property and that sort of surprises all of us. Uh, so. Uh, I would like to see the list of things that Travis Turner identified um, kind of evaluated, uh, uh, and I would suggest that you know, the town manager, the chairman of the town council, carry on discussions uh, with the uh, prospective buyer to see where the accommodation rests mm -hmm. so, that, so that we can at once discharge what we perceive as our responsibility to uh, do no harm to this transaction, but support the working waterfront concepts that have been so clearly expressed and underlie the whole history of this thing. So uh, I, would, I would like to see what what's a tolerable level of restriction. Uh, Councillor Johnson raised a week or so ago with me, the whole idea of using the parking lease, mm -hmm. I think it's a very good idea uh, uh, as the mechanism. It's cleaner uh, because, as Councilor Foley said, there's an awful tangle going on here, and I'm not sure we'll ever be able to actually get through that and untangle it, but the, but the parking lease is pretty straightforward. As a, as a legal mechanism for controlling conduct. <coughs> Thank you. And, and I guess I, I'd kind of echo everything I've heard. I'm in a little different place. I certainly respect Councillor Baybine and talking about not interfering with commerce, but on the other hand, 
as, as we had discussed, this seems like the prior town councils going way back to the original heritage really was around an intent of creating a marketplace and preserving a marketplace for our commercial fisheries. Um, doesn't dictate the price, but it certainly dictates there's, a, there's an avenue for them to have an outlet for their product. I found, um, as some have echoed, that the starting point of the points that, that the Shellfish Commission and, and Travis put out are reasonable starting points. I think in prior meetings we had <coughs> representation that there's some agreement around some of those things, so mm -hmm. I think there is a way to have a conversation to see where there is middle ground. Absolutely agree that the parking lease is, is probably our best mechanism to make sure that we see what happens down there is what we want to see. Um, but, I, but I think it's really critical that we do preserve that working waterfront. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is going away all over the coast of Maine. All you have to do is turn to the city of Portland and some of the things that are happening. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think with that, I don't know, Tom, if you were keeping track, but it sure sounds like there's a fair amount of concurrence around working around the list that Travis shared and some things are not issues because they're being the dirt parking lot we know is already right. sort of outside the right. preview so I think it comes down to a handful of items that, that we can have a conversation <coughs> if you don't mind um, actually there was one item I, so I agree on the parking lease piece by the way I think it needs to be brought up to market rate yeah, I agree. Um, yep. outside of the issue of connectivity to the deal um, there was a um, suggestion around, around um, a party outside of the town council having a right of refusal for future sale or future transfer and I would not support that um, this this body is here to protect the town's interest not any individual um, co corporation any individual families any individual um, that needs to go out to market and let it let the market control that so I really don't believe that that's appropriate in this type of document um, many of a point of clarification is, is tra I don't have my glasses on, is Travis still out yes. yeah, right. Was that right of first refusal for the town as it exists in sort of the documents, sort of, we talked about that, there's some language so in there. Or was something that was mentioned just in the long of a few fishermen, or a bunch of fishermen who hold interest in creating a, a, a fisherman's co-op, haven't had the opportunity. Question for the council: Did we want to? Did we want to think about first refusal for the town, or is that is there any Absolutely. consensus around that, or do we want that language in or out, or for the town? For the town. For the town. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. okay. So yeah. we. So we didn't. That wasn't on our. But that that would be added to this list by first refusal for the town. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I do want to observe. There's, uh, I guess, three parties to this transaction, arguably. Uh, We've talked about prospective buyer. We've talked about the town. There's also the current owner that uh, that needs to be part of these conversations. Depending on what yes. uh, sort of restrictions we impose, that certainly could have effect on sale price and value and, and so on and so forth. So, I just wanted to make sure uh, I would intend to involve them in these discussions yeah. uh, equally. Yes. May I make a suggestion? Uh, if it's if possible, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about suggestions that. Travis made. Is it possible to include uh, representatives from the a, a representative from the Shellfish Committee and the Coastal Harvest Committee as stakeholders to be 
tracking with this process in some way. I mean, they're not principals, they're not directly involved in the transaction. However, they are going to be <coughs> affected significantly. So I, I don't know what shape that takes, uh, but if there, you know, I, I, that would be helpful in my mind. So a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Yeah, and, well, I think yeah. that could be problematic, but I would yeah. encourage anyone that has uh, concerns beyond what's been expressed tonight to, to make them known to the oh, chair or myself yeah. or any member of council, and we'll do our best to evaluate how we can bring those forward or whether we should. Um, I think it's hard to involve that many people in a negotiation, frankly. Uh, I understand. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. So we'll close that out and we'll move back <coughs> to item nine on the agenda, which is the standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. And Sean, would you like to kick it off? Sure. Finance um, um, has met. Um, did want to um, announce that we will be having a joint committee uh, meeting with the school board on February 11th at 5:30 here in Chambers. Um, the purpose of that meeting is to really begin our joint process in looking at cost drivers um, and discussing um, what we might see in the um, budget um, and in the future. Um, there will also be a conversation around, and by the way, it's not just about the school budget. There's also cost driver discussions around the town. Um, there's going to be a conversation around the tax, the impact of the tax valuation, evaluation. I um, also wanted to uh, tell you that, um, while it's not published now, but um, we'll confirm these um, after that meeting on the 11th that um, um, we will be scheduling our presentations not only to the Town Council's Finance Committee. Um, I will say that we have tentatively approved by consensus, um, not formally, but um, we will be having three meetings with departments. Um, the definitive one is the first one, which will be with the school department. Um, we've moved that to the forefront, um, and I'm giving them literally uh, one of the meetings is almost prim primarily dedicated to that so that we can ask a lot of questions. And then <coughs> also wanted to mention that right now um, the school board and the council are, are soliciting from each other um, opportunities for our community meetings in which two, um, I believe I saw a document where I believe there might be two councilors and two school board members now at each one of the meetings starting on April 8th. Um, that first meeting is actually at the public library at 2 p.m. on Monday the 8th, April 8th. Um, and um, there was one other thing I wanted to mention, and I don't remember. What was it about, Peter? <laughs> the policy. <laughs> the policy that we're talking about regarding depreciation. Oh, funding the, the reserves? Yes, yeah, so funding the reserves. So, um, so one of the items that has been brought up over several years that we're um, initiating is a discussion around how do we fund our uh, reserves and then use that towards capital purchases. So um, Tom is providing us with an overview as part of his budget to see if we can begin um, working towards compliance, which we have six years to be compliant uh, based on a previous approval. So um, that's a, kind of a significant move for us in that budget. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah, Councilor Johnson. Okay, uh, Communications Committee met uh, this past Monday. Uh, I am told to nudge my fellow councilors that um, your write-up for the e-newsletter is due. Ooh. Uh, for the councilor's, cor councilor's corner. Nice. Katie Foley's will be coming out next, I believe. So. Nice. Um, also, we actually have a joint communication committee meeting with the BOE immediately before the joint finance committee meeting. <laughs> uh, the BOE is working double time that day. Uh, so that will be from 4 to 5 15. Uh, same date, same time. So next, next Monday, correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, and I know it's a lot of dates and this is going to get confusing, but we are going to have a first quarterly constituent meeting, which will not be budget related. Uh, we're going to, um, both communication committees on the BOE and the town council are going to hold four quarterly meetings this year, uh, which will have two members of each. And that first one will be Tuesday, March 26th, and that's from 6 to 8 here in the chambers. Um, again, this is independent from the finance committee and the budget meetings. Uh, this is an um, open forum to come and uh, tell us what's on your mind. And lastly, as the BOE liaison, uh, this coming Monday at 5.30 in the high school cafeteria is the first superintendent forum um, to get some public input about the future superintendent. So if you can be in three places at once, uh, Monday is going to be a pretty busy day. Thank you. Um, yeah, busy few weeks with lots of meetings. Um, Councilor Johnson's already talked about communication. I'll let Council Katarina speak to ordinance. Uh, Conservation Committee also um, 
just moving forward just so that everybody is aware and I'll be following up with people individually um, but they are starting some education efforts and um, outreach around uh, the, a proposed uh, plastic bag ban. Um, so it's a little sh little bit of a switch from what the initial conversations were. Um, and so I would expect lots of questions to come back because I still have lots of questions uh, around how we went from A to B and I missed one meeting. So um, I'll find that out uh, in the coming week. And I'm no longer the Eastern Trail uh, Alliance uh, liaison. However, I am still on the Eastern Trail Alliance Gala Committee. And uh, if you folks will remember, last year we had the Taste of the Town was an inaugural event held at Camp Fetcha to raise money for the trail. It was hugely successful, tons of fun, great food. Um, so keep your eyes out for that date coming out. Councilor mm -hmm. Katarish? Uh, yes, the uh, plastic bags, Councilor Foley. <laughs> it may have been me who kind of said to go out. Did they connect? I'm sorry, I'm going through the chair here. Do they connect with the Ecos kids? Because I met with the kids from Ecos and told them to talk to you guys. All right, thank you. May Municipal Legislature. Um, we meet monthly for a whole day and go over all the bills that we put in and decide as a um, group, as May Municipal Association, what we're going to get behind. The three big things that we're going to be getting behind is uh, the restoration of municipal revenue sharing. There are several bills in with all sorts of permutations, all from going all the way back to the beginning of the LePage administration and recapturing to just having it this fiscal year and all sorts of things. But we obviously are in support of that. Also, the restoration of the a true 55% funding of education, which would also involve uh, moving teacher retirement back to the state. That was strongly supported by the Maine Municipal. And the local option sales tax has been strongly supported also, but I this is Jean Marie's opinion on that, not the main municipal. I think that that will get sacrificed uh, to put municipal <coughs> revenue sharing through the restoration of municipal revenue sharing. But that's just my my prediction on what will happen there. As Sean can tell you, there are tons of bills mm -hmm. that will be coming out that will be published and whatever. What's the number, Sean? Do you know? Remember? 2,358. Oh, okay. Or somewhere so, around that. Oh, yeah. So there's all sorts of things that we'll be looking at. Um, <clears throat> my next meeting in Augusta is on the 28th. Uh, historic preservation. Um, I just had my first meeting with them last night, so I've got a lot to get ca caught up on. But it, they've finished up a list of buildings designated as historic to be preserved. I've got more to learn about, you know, if people have buildings that they want to <coughs> put on the list and whatever. The good news about historic preservation in Scarborough is, unlike some other towns, we don't put all sorts of restrictions on what you can and can't do, but it does flag <coughs> code enforcement that, geez, did you know you're living in a historic building and we may be able to help you? and Because we want them to be preserved as, as best as possible. Uh, and the school building on Holmes Road, my understanding, I was told, it was purchased by the Historic Society, but I've got to do a little more research on what's going on with that. And it's also my understanding that the Historic Society needs to raise $60,000 to at least get the foundation work and the roof done so that the building doesn't fall apart sitting there. And it's got some broken windows and whatever. So anyway, those are some of the things we're involved in. Ordinance. Uh, our next meeting is February 21st. The big thing that came out of ordinance, please mark on your calendars. We will be discussing marijuana and retail <laughs> marijuana and medical marijuana and what are we going to do and, and what's the direction of the town. And on Valentine's Day, February 14th, we're going to be having a forum here at Town Hall at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, with our attorney. Um, I, our town attorney happens to be one of the state experts in the legal aspects of, of marijuana use. And we will be having a second forum February 26th at 6 p.m. So for anyone who's interested or wants to give some input, we want to hear from you. We'd like to have you come and uh, tell us, you know, your thoughts on what we should be doing as a town. I will also tell you as a personal aside that we do have a pot czar now in the state. 
<laughs> who happens to be a very good friend of mine. I was like, how the heck did you get that job? But anyway, so I have a direct line now to the pot czar, so <laughs> just let me know what you think. <laughs> All right? If you could just comment uh, on, on these forms. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the issue of publicizing these forms, on the the matter, communications might be interested. We're trying to use social media and all other means to broadcast uh, and advertise yeah. these dates. Um, Facebook actually has not allowed, in fact, we've had to file an appeal because it's considered oh, a political activity. So mm -hmm. we've not been able to use that, that means, and that's unfortunate. So we, we filed an appeal, and hopefully we'll be able to get some dispensation and use Facebook to publicize the event. So, okay. Anyway, that's it for me. That's, that's enough entertainment for one night. <laughs> Housing Alliance, uh, I met with the Chair Marge DeSanctis, uh, the Town Manager, and uh, Committee Member Will Rowan, uh, who had been the liaison on, just to get up to speed on what's going on. The process uh, is moving forward to have an open-ended uh, invitation to developers, builders, and uh, affordable housing experts to apply to the town for funding support. Uh, the process, the uh, uh, earlier effort at putting <coughs> an RFP sort of thing out there uh, fell short. Didn't really garner any uh, any activity. So uh, they're actively moving forward to try and structure uh, enough documentation and information that would allow anyone who has an interest in building affordable housing to do so and submit an application. Uh, it'll be entertained, uh, uh, reported on by the Affordable Ho uh, Housing Alliance to the Town Council, and then be submitted to the Town Council for approval. So I, I was very encouraged by, by that, and uh, uh, the leadership of Marge and Will uh, is a very strong leadership for the town on this. Mm -hmm. uh, the Energy Committee, uh, uh, I met with Jamie Fitch. She's the town's new sustainability coordinator. They are working on a proposed expansion of their charge to reflect matters beyond energy. Uh, last year, people remember, they led uh, the effort on a composting initiative. Uh, and it's these sorts of things that I think they recognize that there are ways in which to advance quality of life issues that go beyond just energy. And so uh, it sounds interesting they're developing a charge that'll have to come to us uh, for approval. Uh, rules and policies uh, met. Uh, uh, Katie, Paul, and I are uh, on the committee. Uh, we <coughs> had identified uh, before our first meeting what we thought were things that uh, uh, we should at least evaluate. Uh, the first was the co public comment section of, our, of course, part of that is up there on the wall uh, in terms of decorum. Uh, uh, Paul really was leading that effort. We're really not sure that there's, there's enough there. I think we might even be looking at, and I want councilors to be aware that I think at our next meeting, we're really gonna talk seriously about, historically, there was a reason for a lot of the uh, restriction. Uh, good judgment really is the, it should be the rule in all cases as to how you conduct yourself. Uh, so whether we should have the rule at all will be uh, on, the, on the agenda. Uh, uh, political speech, uh, uh, Katie was taking the lead on that and uh, did a draft of some suggested change, language changes, and that was a good discussion. It did identify some weaknesses in the current language. Uh, where uh, uh, the rules actually s explicitly restrict counselor uh, exercising their uh, right of free speech on, on things that we want counselors to actually uh, exercise that. So I think there are some uh, things that will come out of that that are going to be effective. Uh, we uh, uh, took a look at the TIF. CEA policy issue, remember, coming out of the Scarborough Downs effort was the idea. We certainly would have benefited as a community to have a clearer mission as to how to do that, how to negotiate that deal. Uh, uh, Larissa 
Crockett, the assistant town manager, staffing the effort to identify good models. Uh, we met with Karen Martin. Uh, uh, she's very knowledgeable on TIFFs. Uh, uh, the policies seemed, uh, and, and we looked at both Portland's and Freeport's policies. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, they seem to be doing essentially two things. One is they set up a very clear <coughs> process of review so that anybody who wants to advance a proposed TIF district, whether it's internal within the body of uh, a municipal government or whether it's a third party, citizen, property owner, business person, uh, uh, we'd have real rules, rules of the road. Uh, and, and we did not really have that before. Uh, uh, we also uh, are seeing that these drafts, the, the ones that have been adopted in both Freeport and uh, Portland, do provide guidelines uh, for flexibility to deal with the myriad of situations in which TIFs and credit enhancement agreements can arise. Uh, and so uh, they're not, they do not try and get into the weeds of uh, requiring this or that. And so those are kind of some of the things that the three of us, I think, learned in our first go around. The uh, intention is to try and have uh, Karen Martin as the economic development director of the town and Larissa Crockett uh, uh, work to try and uh, do a draft that can actually get presented to the uh, committee, uh, whether it's March 1, which is our next meeting, uh, or the next month, we'll see how the work goes. Uh, and then once we actually have something that we're uh, uh, satisfied with, pass it to the Finance Committee. That might end up being, uh, hopefully, after the three Finance Committee members are not completely tied up with the budget, which is really the uh, uh, February, March, April time frame. So it would be coming for a review. That would have six of the seven town councilors and Jean Marie actually attended the meeting also, so. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, have a look at it before it gets to the council, which I actually think is a pretty good idea. That's great. Yes. Thank you. Councilor Hill. Uh, we had a, a couple of uh, appointments uh, for first reading, uh, uh, recommending uh, to the town council for, uh, for posting uh, for second reading at our next meeting. Uh, the name of uh, Nick Cloutier to the Board of Assessment Review as the first alternate with a term to expire in 2021. Uh, additionally, <clears throat> Patricia Brigham to the Community Services and Recreational Advisory Board as second alternate term expiring 2020. Uh, and um, Thomas Nolan to the Conservation Commission as a full voting member term to expire 2021. Uh, additionally, there are uh, several SEDCO appointments that we'd like to uh, um, present as, uh, as a first reading. Um, Andrea Killiard and Kevin Freeman uh, will uh, uh, be continuing for their third and final uh, three-year terms uh, ending 2021. Uh, and there will be uh, two new appointments recommended uh, Travis Kennedy uh, for a term, three-year term uh, ending 2021, and David Martin, no relation to Karen, uh, who will be um, serving uh, a, a term ending 2020. So, thank you. Thank you. So with that, um, Tom Manager's report, Tom? Yes, a few quick matters. I know we're getting late here. Uh, tax bills went out today. This is for second half taxes due, uh, I believe, March 15th. Uh, yeah. Uh, budget uh, continues. My department heads are working feverishly. Essentially, they've got a deadline by, I believe it's February 22nd, I set for them to submit their budget proposals to me. Uh, that's really the first time that I'll be able to see everything together and get a sense of um, some of the challenges, perhaps, or, or opportunities. Uh, and then I'll have the balance of really the month of uh, March to fine tune that, put the budget document together and make uh, the presentation uh, in early April. Uh, superintendent and myself concluded uh, four listen to learn sessions. Last week was our last session. I must say they were not as well attended as they were last year. Uh, that's not to say we didn't have 
good conversation, and I did have a, a number of important takeaways, and I'm prepared to respond and report those out to uh, over the joint finance group on Monday. It might be the best place for Julie and I to do that. Uh, public safety building sale. Uh, we're well over a year on the market. Mm -hmm. Things are frankly, uh, we had an interesting little flurry over the holidays, which was terribly, totally unexpected, frankly. Mm -hmm. Uh, but things, if there's a bit of a lull again, we think we need to shake some things up, uh, including possibly a price reduction. So mm -hmm. I'll work with council chair to see if uh, we want to bring our commercial broker in and uh, have a conversation with council around what our experience has been to date and what we've learned from that and what that might uh, inform us for the future. So uh, if that pleases the council, I'm, I'm pleased to have her um, spend some time with you. Uh, our tax appeal matters, uh, these involve about 51 properties. Uh, as expected, uh, the plaintiffs, or at least most of them at this point, have appealed the matter to law court. This was uh, an expected turn. Um, in response to that, uh, we are in a position to file a counter appeal, which is essentially the position we've been maintaining right along. Uh, I'm told from the lawyers, if we can believe what they say in this regard, that uh, the, the heavy lifting is done. Uh, this matter has been so fully briefed and argued um, that there's not terrible expense going forward to prepare these submissions. Um, the uh, Director of Information Technology Search, a very critical position for town and school alike, uh, is going well. I'm pleased to report um, that we had uh, a tremendous candidate pool. I was really um, somewhat concerned given my challenges or experience last time, uh, but been very pleased with the candidates. We're uh, scheduling second interviews for next week, so I hope to have some further report to you in that regard. And lastly, at your place this evening, you'll see the audit report. I'm pleased to say, and shocked to say, uh, <laughs> there, are, there are no management uh, comments for uh, the town or the school. Uh, it's the first time in my professional experience, the auditors always seem to find something. Uh, but uh, certainly a testament to uh, town staff um, to make sure that uh, they're doing everything uh, above board. Uh, I know we have a joint presentation scheduled. I believe it's on February 20th. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. I think so, yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So that will be a joint presentation to the Board of Education and Town Council. Uh, we'll have that prior to the council meeting. And at this point, that, that meeting is uh, trending pretty light. Uh, we have two or three items uh, coming back to you, so uh, we should be able to handle that quite comfortably in one, one evening. And I suspect you'll speak to uh, some of the recent progress regarding team building and or goal setting. I can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for everybody's patience. We have the date we did arrive on is the 20th. 25th. Yeah. Fifth, I believe. We'll get this out. But the, the good news is we have a date that everyone seems, uh, it, it seems workable. Great. 25th. I better put it in quick. I think everybody yeah. was a little <laughs> cold. Yes. I think everybody at work. So thank you. Thank you for your patience in doing that. Um, and then for that, town council members, maybe start with Councillor Hamlin if you have any closing comments or. I'm pretty talked out. Good. For <laughs> honest. <laughs> So, but uh, th thank you. Um, I'm good discussion tonight. Tough issues, you know, uh, lined up, and uh, they're not easy. But I'm glad we're able to have a full, frank, and civil discussion. And uh, I want to thank the my fellow counselors for uh, your support and my disclosure. Thank you. Uh, just one other thought that I had that I did not express earlier, and that is, the it's this. Uh, um, that the Piper Shores people really allow the public uh, around their property and enjoy the gorgeous view and you can walk around. And it, it's really, and the more I've thought about what's being proposed here, it's, there is going to be, because of the clustering, a big public space uh, with walkways and fields and, and it's a lovely setting out there. And so uh, I think it could be something special because Piper Shores always seems to do it up first rate. And I think it actually, as an open space concept, could be, uh, could be quite a nice contribution to the community. Uh, and that uh, both that, those neighborhoods there, as well as the public generally, would, would find this to be another wonderful little space hidden away. Does it cut a um, 
the only comment I want to say is that, you know, just to echo uh, Councillor Hamill, is yeah, we've got a couple of thorny issues, but what else is new? <laughs> um, I think it's important for all of us to, to continue our, you know, thoughtful conversations with one another and, and with the public. And, you know, sometimes we do make decisions that not everyone's happy with, but that's our job. Um, but uh, I, I also want to thank the public because I, I felt that my conversations with members of the public on both Piper Shores and, and um, Pine Point have, have been really good. So okay. good tones of civility going on there. So that's great. That's maybe, awesome. yeah. maybe turn the page. That's great. I hope so. <laughs> Councilor Fuller? Um, yeah, just a couple things. Um, I had the opportunity to participate in the um, GP Cogs uh, chair, vice chair, little training session that they did. And there were quite a few towns represented. I was actually pleasantly surprised that how many folks were there, about 20 of us. And um, it was really comforting to hear that, um, although when I said I was from Scarborough, I did get a little bit of a, a rise from the audience about our sleepy little town. But uh, it, uh, it was comforting to hear that a lot of the things that we grapple with, they're also grappling with. And that ranging from, you know, how do you better engage with your constituents? Uh, how do you communicate all of those things? So it was good. Um, I also participated or held, I should say, a kind of an informal meeting with some folks that I knew had some energy around kind of move, possibly moving forward with a project to honor veterans in our town in a very special way. And um, I invited Karen Martin, and she was instrumental in awesome, um, as she often is, uh, in helping us put together some ideas around how to move this forward. So I don't know how I'm going to engage the council in this, because it's not really council work per se, and yet it could could very well um, be a, a great partnership and a great thing to honor our veterans. Uh, and then last but not least, it's I know it's still another week and a half away, but Project Grace is having their fuel rally um, Saturday, Saturday the 16th, I think. Yep. Um, so make sure you're looking out for that. There's lots of, uh, many of us are so blessed to be, you know, warm and safe all the time. And there's a lot of Scarborough residents who are not and could use our help. So um, pay attention for that opportunity. And then, oh, lastly, but not least, for the town manager, um, it's not a price reduction. It's a price improvement or enhancement. <laughs> So we want to make sure that you know, real estate terms. We want to real estate. We want to make sure we put a positive uh, spin on it. Yes, exactly. Well, we did realize we have a water view from the roof, so I assure you that. Water <laughs> water water well, so. There you go. Deck, deck up top. Price improvement. Thank you. <laughs> Along that line, um, nine-year-old Mary McGarry would like to suggest that we have the old public safety building as a homeless shelter. So I told her that I would present it to the council. So, Mary, I have presented your request to the council. Uh, and besides that, I have nothing further. <laughs> Thank you. I do have a couple of things, actually. First, um, to kind of get some legislative pieces out of the way, I did want to, uh, and actually it's town related, uh, uh, Anthony Atardo Jr. retired after 33 years of excellent service with our emergency medical services division uh, in public safety. Um, the entire Scar Scarborough delegation presented him with a sentiment uh, in congratulating his accomplishment. And, you know, from a town perspective, um, he was one of the, him and his father were one of the first couple of people I met when I came to town. Um, and I uh, wish him the best of luck in that retirement um, and Godspeed. Also wanted to mention that we presented a sentiment to uh, another Scarborough resident, John, um, and I hope I pronounced the last name right, Falona. Uh, Mr. Falona lives in Scarborough, but has worked in Gardner um, with his company for many, many uh, years and decades. And he was um, the most recently, he was the 2019 Lifetime Achievement Award recipient from the Kennebec Valley um, um, Chamber of Commerce. Um, so I wanted to congratulate Tim. Um, a lot of Scarborough residents uh, do work in many other areas throughout the state. So it's uh, nice to see that recognition for them. And I did want to mention to the rest of the council that if you see or hear and know of anyone that deserves, um, they're, they're not, um, um, they're very <coughs> prestigious and um, every single person is willing, uh, is um, um, eligible for one. And so, uh, you know, Chris Chiazzo, Representative Chiazzo and the entire delegation, we would love to present those. So we rely on reading our papers, but also hearing from you. So you're always welcome to contact me. 
Um, last is that um, I'm starting to try to um, manage my workload between, between council and all these emails. And so I did want to mention publicly and then for the council is that any issues that you have regarding state, um, if you can make sure that you send that to my legislative email because of FOIA requests through the state. Um, not, I don't want people to be nerdy going, why am I getting something on the council email and then I'm sending it to myself to the legislative email, but I have to retain records. But um, that email address, if you'd like to contact me, is my first and last name separated by a dot at legislature.main.gov. Uh, and Representative Chiazzo is exactly the same. Um, so if you uh, would do that, that would be wonderful. Um, I wanted to thank everyone who showed up for the workshop um, um, as well, you know, for the, I'll call the two workshops, uh, both uh, by Peshores and, and Pine Point. It's, it's very important to hear from the constituents that impact, are impacted. I'm informing it, and I hope, if anything, it shows <coughs> um, that we uh, really need to provide a balance in how we come to our decisions because it is about the entire community, not just those who are impacted in one particular area, but throughout the community um, as a whole. Um, you know, I brought up the, the, two, the, the building of the original, uh, the new pier, the working waterfront pier. Um, I got to tell you, that, and that was like 2004, so I'd only been on the council for four years, five years. And I was like, hey, we're getting two and a half million dollars from the state. How can anybody be upset with me in getting free money to rebuild a pier? And just like everything else, particularly in Pine Point, half the community completely <laughs> supported it and half the community um, thought I was, um, well, first they made sure I was aware that they thought I was from away. <laughs> Um, and that I shouldn't be meddling um, in making changes like that. So um, it's kind of one of those things where I guess if you can't make everyone happy, you must be doing something right. Um, and then um, I did want to mention uh, David Green, um, who is the first citizen that spoke regarding, um, if I can get this, don't ask me to say it 10 times fast, Milky, uh, Milky, Milky Ribbon Worms, and why did we allow on the Shellfish Committee to uh, do away with the, uh, <laughs> the testing that they were doing with part of the UNE. Um, I, I gotta be honest, I've always been honest with David. Um, <coughs> he's a unique person and he has taught me a lot about things that I never thought I would ever need to know about, uh, including piggeries and um, milky worms um, that are in the clam flats. Um, I rely on our committees like Shellfish, um, long range planning, no matter what it is, to provide the guidance and, and the expertise in making that decision. And over time, the fact is that committees change, town councils change. And so um, uh, we all know that there's been a change to the Shellfish Committee significantly. And so um, I did not question them exiting that program because I felt that they must have um, debated it themselves. And so I relied on that committee to make that decision. Last is that I would really like to hear from counselors in particular, but anybody, there are two bills in which at the legislature that I, um, impact Scarborough significantly that I have co-signed on. Um, the first um, will be very hard for anyone to tell me not to support, but I'd love to still hear from you, and that is regarding main revenue sharing. I've co-sponsored a bill to increase that to 5%. Right now it's a little less than 2.4, um, which is the old standard, um, the 5%. I'd like to hear from that. But also I've um, co-sponsored a bill regarding uh, pre-K, um, and if there is ever uh, participation, right now it's not mandated, um, but um, the bill actually requires that the state fund pre-K programs at 50% should a community um, opt in and start that. Um, I think that obviously that's important, so I'd love to hear from our school-minded um, people in town as well as the council on, on where you are on that. Um, and I can give you more details around the nuances of that because, it's not, again, it's not a mandated um, item. Um, I did want to ask of the manager um, one of the complaints I'm receiving is um, regarding the tax evaluation and particularly about the assessors because they are outside contractors. Um, so it's making some people nervous because um, they're coming into a neighborhood, they have out-of-state plates, um, they're on property, um, sometimes um, neighbors see it but people aren't home or there isn't proper like identification. I don't know if there's something that can be made um, to help them identify themselves. Uh, all vehicles should be labeled with uh, <coughs> it, 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 all personnel have uh, name badges. Okay. And anyone who has any question should certainly not let the person in their house. They oh, absolutely. Yeah. We can keep okay. confirmed. Yeah, the ones that talked to me didn't see any of those IDs, so I, I wasn't sure. Okay, all right. And last, I did want to put some context around the fuel rally. So that is on Monday, I'm sorry, on Saturday, and it's from 10 to 2 at the Dunstan Fire Station. Um, Oh, sorry, not 10 to 2. I'm misreading. 10 to 12. Is that at Dunstan? I believe so. It's Always has here. been. I don't know. I, I oh, I'm, I'm missing. I'm sorry. Oak Hill. Sorry. Right. <laughs> Oak Hill Fire Station. 
Uncle Fire Station. My head's going back and forth on too many things. <laughs> but thank you for indulgence. Yeah. So I guess with that, it's late, and thank you for your patience in staying. Um, yes. The only the only comment I have is Tom Tom was was a little humble, but to get audit reports, I think that we've been on the finance committee for a while together, Sean, and I think this is the first year we haven't got any any sort of findings, which is just a, a, a great testament to the yeah. staff. So okay. kudos and thank you. And first ever. With that, for anybody that's interested in making a motion to adjourn, it would be so great. Second. 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 All those in favor? <laughs> Third. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. Fourth, fifth, sixth. Yes, totally. Mm -hmm. So we'll get some work to do. Nice. Monday. Tomorrow we'll show up at